Manford was ending his speech now, talking about Lothar's promotion. Of course, Sarah thought bitterly, his promotion would not have been so rapid if his father had not been the Minister of Police, and he had not had such skill with a rugby ball. Her own Corbus could expect no such preferment. Everything he achieved would be with his own talent and by his own efforts. She and Rolf could do little for him. Rolf's influence was minimal, and even the university fees for Jacobus' education were a serious drain on their family finances. She had been forced to face the fact that Rolf would never go much further than he was now. His entry into legal practice had been a mistake and a failure. By the time he had accepted that fact and returned to the academic life as a lecturer in law, he had lost so much seniority that it would be many years, if ever, before he was given the chair of law. No, there was not much they could do to help Corbus. But then, of course, none of the family, not even Corbus himself, knew what he wanted from life. He was a brilliant student, but he totally lacked direction or purpose, and he had always been a secretive lad. It was so difficult to draw him out. Once or twice Sarah had succeeded in doing so, but she had been frightened by the strange and radical views he expressed. Perhaps it was best not to explore her son's mind too deeply, she thought, and smiled across at him just as, at last, Manfred stopped singing his own son's praises. Jacobus came to her side now. Can I get you another orange juice, Ma? Your glass is empty. Uh, no, thanks, Cobus. Uh, stay with me for a while. I see so little of you these days. The men had charged their beer tankards and, led by Manfred, trooped towards the barbecue fires on the far side of the pool. Amid laughter and raillery, Manfred and Lothar were tying candy-striped aprons around their waists and arming themselves with long-handled forks. On a side table, there was a huge array of platters piled with raw meat, lamb chops and societies on long skewers. German sausages and great thick steaks, enough to feed an army of starving giants, and, Sarah calculated sourly, costing almost her husband's monthly salary. Since Manfred and his one-armed, demented father had mysteriously acquired shares in that fishing company in South West Africa, he had become not only famous and powerful, but enormously rich as well. Heidi had a mink coat now, and Manfred had purchased a large farm in the rich maize-producing belt of the Orange Free State. It was every Afrikaner's dream to own a farm, and Sarah felt her envy flare as she thought about it. All that should have been hers. She had been deprived of what was rightly hers by that German whore. The word shocked her, but she repeated it silently. Whore. He was mine, whore, and you stole him from me. Jacobus was talking to her, but she found it difficult to follow what he was saying. Her attention kept stealing back to Manfred de la Rey. Every time his great laugh boomed out, she felt her heart contract, and she watched him from the corners of her eyes. Manfred was holding court. Even dressed in that silly apron, and with a cooking fork in his hand, he was still the focus of all attention and respect. Every few minutes, more guests arrived to join the gathering, most of them important and powerful men, but all of them gathered slavishly around Manfred and deferred to him. We should understand why he did it, Jacobus was saying, and Sarah forced herself to concentrate on her son. Uh, who did it, dear? she asked vaguely. Ma, you haven't been listening to a word, Jacobus smiled gently. You really are a little scatterbrained sometimes. Sarah always felt vaguely uncomfortable when he spoke to her in such a familiar fashion. None of her friend's children would show such disrespect, even in fun. I was talking about Moses Gama, Jacobus went on, and at the mention of that name, everybody within earshot turned towards the two of them. They're going to hang that black thunder at last, somebody said, and everybody agreed immediately. Yeah, about time. We have to teach them a lesson. You show mercy to a kafir, and he takes it as weakness. Only one thing they understand. Oh, I think it'll be a mistake to hang him, Jacobus said clearly, and there was a stunned silence. Kubi, Kubi, Sarah tugged at her son's arm. Uh, not now, darling. People don't like that sort of talk. That is because they never hear it, and they don't understand it, Jacobus explained reasonably. But some of them turned away deliberately, 
while a middle-aged cousin of Manfred's said truculently, Come on, Sari, can't you stop your brat talking like a commie? Please, Corby, she used the diminutive as, as a special appeal, for my sake. Manfred de la Rey had become aware of the disturbance and the flare of hostility amongst his guests, and now he looked across the fires on which the stakes were sizzling, and he frowned. Don't you see, Ma, we have to talk about it. If we don't, people will never hear any other point of view. None of them even read the English newspapers. Kubi, you will anger your Uncle Marnie, Sarah pleaded. Please stop it now. We Afrikaners are cut off in this little make-believe world of ours. We think that if we make enough laws, the black people will cease to exist, except as our servants. Manfred had come across from the fires now, and his face was dark with anger. Jakobus Stunder, he rumbled softly. Your father and your mother are my oldest and dearest friends, but do not trespass on the hospitality of this house. I will not have wild and treasonable ideas bandied about in front of my family and friends. Behave yourself or leave immediately. For a moment it seemed the boy might defy him. Then he dropped his gaze and mumbled. I'm sorry, Uamani. But when Manfred turned and strode back to the barbecue fire, he said just loud enough for Sarah to hear, you see, they won't listen. They don't want to hear. They're afraid of the truth. How can you make a blind man see? Manfred de la Rey was still inwardly seething with anger at the youth's ill manners, but outwardly he was his usual bluff self as he resumed his self-imposed duties over the cooking fires and led the jovial banter of his male guests. Gradually his irritation subsided, and he had almost put aside Moses' garma and the long shadow that he had thrown over them all, when his youngest daughter came running down from the long, low, ranch-type house. Pa! Pa, there's a telephone call for you. I can't come now, Scotty, Manfred called. We don't want our guests to starve. Take a message. It's Um Dani, his daughter insisted, and he says he must talk to you now. It's very important. Manfred sighed and grumbled good-naturedly as he untied his apron and handed his fork to Rolf Stander. Don't let them burn, and he strode up to the house. Yeah, he barked into the telephone. I don't like to disturb you, Marnie. Then why do you do it, Manfred demanded. Danny LaRue was a senior police general and one of his most able officers. Uh, it's this man, Gama. Oh, let the bastard hang. That's what he wants. No, he wants to do a deal. Uh, send someone else to speak to him. I do not want to waste my time. He will only talk to you, and we believe he has something important he will be able to tell you. Manfred thought for a moment. His instinct was to dismiss the request out of hand, but he let reason dictate to him. All right, he agreed heavily. I'll meet him. There would also be a perverse pleasure in confronting a vanquished foe. But he is going to hang. Nothing will stop that, he warned quietly. The prison authority had confiscated the leopard skin robes of chieftainship, and Moses Garma wore the prison issue suiting of coarse, unbleached calico. The long, unremitting strain of awaiting the outcome of his appeal had told heavily. For the first time, Vicky noticed the frosting of white in his cap of dark, crinkling hair, and his features were gaunt his eyes sunken in dark, bruised-looking hollows. Her compassion for him threatened to overwhelm her, and she wished that she could reach out and touch him, but the steel mesh screen separated them. This is the last time I am allowed to visit you, she whispered, and they will only let me stay for fifteen minutes. That will be long enough, for there is not much to say now that the sentence has been confirmed. Oh, Moses, you were wrong to believe that the British and the Americans would save you. They tried, he said quietly, but they did not try very hard. And now what will I do without you? What will the child I am carrying do without a father? You are a daughter of Zulu. You will be strong. I will try, Moses, my husband, she whispered. But what of your people? They are also children without a father. What will become of them? She saw the old fierce fire burn in his eyes. She had feared it had been forever extinguished, and she felt a brief and bitter joy to know it was still alight. The others will seek to take your place now. 
those of the Congress who hate and envy you. When you die, they will use your sacrifice to serve their own ambitions. She saw that she had reached him again and that he was angry. She sought to inflame his anger, to give him reason and strength to go on living. If you die, your enemies will use your dead body as a stepping stone to climb to the place you have left empty. Why do you torment me, woman? he asked. Because I do not want you to die, because I want you to live. For me, for our child, for our people. That cannot be, he said. The hard boars will not yield, not even to the demands of the great powers. Unless you can find wings for me to fly over these walls, then I must go to my fate. There is no other way. There is a way, Vicky told him. There is a way for you to survive and for you to put down the enemy who seek to usurp your place as the leader of the black nations. He stared at her as she went on. When the day comes that we sweep the boars into the sea and open the doors of the prisons, you will emerge to take your rightful place at the head of the revolution. What is this way, woman? What is this hope that you hold out to me? He listened without expression as she propounded it to him. And when she had finished, he said gravely, It is true that the lioness is fiercer and crueler than the lion. Will you do it, my lord? Not for your own sake, but for all us weak ones who need you so. I will think on it, he conceded. There is so little time, she warned. The black ministerial Cadillac was delayed only briefly at the gates of the prison for they were expecting Manfred de la Rey. As the steel gates swung open, the driver accelerated through into the main courtyard and turned into the parking slot that had been kept free. The prison commissioner and two of his senior staff were waiting, and they hurried forward as soon as Manfred climbed out of the rear door. Briefly, Manfred shook hands with the commissioner and said, I wish to see the prisoner immediately. Uh, of course, minister, it's been arranged. He's waiting for you. Lead the way. Manfred's heavy footfalls echoed along the dreary green-painted corridors while the senior warders scurried ahead to unlock the interleading doors of each section and relock them as Manfred and the prison commissioner passed through. It was a long walk, but they came at last to the condemned block. Uh, how many are waiting execution? Manfred demanded. Uh, Eleven, the commissioner replied. The figure was not unusually high, Manfred reflected. Africa is a violent land, and the gallows play a central role in the administration of justice. I do not want to be overheard, even by those soon to die. It has been arranged, the commissioner assured him. Gama is being kept separate from the others. The warders opened one last steel door, and at the end of a short passage was a barred cell. Manfred went through, but when the commissioner would have followed, Manfred stopped him. Wait here he ordered. Lock the door after me and open it again only when I ring. As the door clanged shut, Manfred walked on to the end of the passage. The cell was small, seven foot by seven, and almost bare. There was a toilet bowl against the side wall and a single iron bunk fixed to the opposite wall. Moses Garmer sat on the edge of the bunk and he looked up at Manfred. Then slowly he came to his feet and crossed the cell to face him through the green-painted bars. Neither man spoke. They stared at each other. Though only the bars separated them, they were a universe and an eternity apart. Though their gazes locked, there was no contact between their minds, and the hostility was a barrier between them more obdurate and irreconcilable than the steel bars. Yes, Manfred asked at last, temptation to gloat over a vanquished adversary was strong, but he withstood it. You asked to see me. I have a proposal to put to you, Moses Garmer said. You wish to bargain for your life? Manfred corrected him, and when Moses was silent, he smiled. So it seems that you are no different from other men, Moses Garmer. You are neither a saint nor even the noble martyr that some say you are. You are no better than other men, no better than any of us. In the end, your loyalty is to yourself alone. You are weak as other men are weak, and like them, you are afraid. 
Do you wish to listen to my proposal? Moses asked, without a sign of having heard the taunts. I will hear what you have to say, Manfred agreed. That is why I came here. I will deliver them to you, Moses said, and Manfred understood immediately. By them you mean those who also claim to be the leaders of your people, the ones who compete with your own claim to that position. Moses nodded, and Manfred chuckled and shook his head with admiration. I will give you the names and the evidence. I will give you the times and the places. Moses was still expressionless. You have underestimated the threat that they are to you. You have underestimated the support they can muster, here and abroad. I will give you that knowledge. And in return, Manfred asked, My freedom, said Moses simply. Machtig! The blasphemy was a measure of Manfred's astonishment. You have the effrontery of a white man. He turned away so that Moses could not see his face while he considered the magnitude of the offer. Moses Garma was wrong. Manfred was fully aware of the threat, and he had a broad knowledge of the extent and the ramifications of the conspiracy. He understood that the world he knew was under terrible siege. The Englishman had spoken of the winds of change. They were blowing not only upon the African continent, but across the world. Everything he held dear, from the existence of his family to that of his folk, and the safety of the land that God had delivered unto them, was under attack by the forces of darkness. Here he was being offered the opportunity to deal those forces a telling blow. He knew then what his duty was. I cannot give you your freedom, he said quietly. That is too much. But you knew that when you demanded it, didn't you? Moses did not answer him, and Manfred went on. This is the bargain I will offer you. I will give you your life. A reprieve, but you will never leave prison again. That is the best I can do. The silence went on so long that Manfred thought he had refused, and he began to turn away when Moses spoke again. I accept. Manfred turned back to him, not allowing his triumph to show. I will want all the names, all the evidence, he insisted. You will have it all, Moses assured him, when I have my reprieve. No, Manfred said quietly. I set the terms. You will have your reprieve when you have earned it. Until then you will get only a stay of execution. Even for that I will need you to name a name, so that I can convince my compatriots of the wisdom of your bargain. Moses was silent, glowering at him through the bars. Give me a name, Manfred insisted. Give me something to take to the Prime Minister. I will do better than that, Moses agreed. I will give you two names. Heed them well. They are Mandela and Rivonia. Michael Courtney was in the city room of the mail when the news that the appellate division had denied Moses Garmer's appeal and confirmed the date of his execution came clattering out on the tape. He let the paper strip run through his fingers, reading it with total concentration. And when the message ended, he went to his desk and sat in front of his typewriter. He lit a cigarette and sat quietly, staring out of the window over the tops of the scraggly trees in Joubert Park. He had a pile of work in his basket and a dozen reference books on his desk. Desmond Blake had slipped out of the office to go down to the George to top up his gin tank and left Michael to finish the article on the American elections. Eisenhower was nearing the end of his final term, and the editor wanted a pen portrait of the presidential candidates. Michael was working on his biographical notes of John Kennedy, but having difficulty choosing the salient facts from the vast amount that had been written about the young Democratic candidate, apart from those that everybody knew, that he was a Catholic and a New Dealer, and that he had been born in 1917. America seemed very far away that morning, and the election of an American president inconsequential in comparison with what he had just read on the tape. As part of his self-education and training, 
Michael made a practice each day of selecting an item of important news and writing a 2,000-word mock editorial upon it. The exercises were for his own sake, the results private and jealously guarded. He showed them to no one, especially not Desmond Blake, whose biting sarcasm and whose willingness to plagiarise Michael had learned to fear. He kept these articles in a folder in the locked bottom drawer of his desk. Usually, Michael worked on these exercises in his own time, staying on for an hour or so in the evening, or sitting up late at night in the little bedsitter he rented in Hillbrow, pecking them out on his rickety old second-hand Remington. However, this morning he had been so moved by the failure of Garma's appeal that he could not concentrate on the Kennedy story. The image of the imperial-looking black man in his leopard-skin robes kept recurring before Michael's eyes, and his words kept echoing in Michael's ears. Suddenly he reached forward and ripped the half-completed page out of his machine. Then he swiftly rolled a clean sheet into it. He didn't have to think. His fingers flew across the keys, and the words sprang up before his eyes. A martyr is born. He rolled the cigarette to the side of his mouth and squinted against the spiral of blue smoke, and the words came in short staccato bursts. He did not have to search for facts or dates or figures. They were all there, crisp and bright in his head. He never paused. He never had to weigh one word against another. The precise word was there on the page almost of its own volition. When he finished it half an hour later, he knew that it was the best thing he had ever written. He read it through once, shaken by the power of his own words, and then he stood up. He felt restless and nervous, the effort of creation, rather than calming or exhausting him, had excited him. He had to get outside. He left the sheet in the typewriter and took his jacket off the back of his chair. The sub glanced up at him inquiringly. Going to find Des, he called. In the newsroom there was a conspiracy to protect Desmond Blake from himself and the gin bottle, and the sub nodded agreement and returned to his work. Once he was out of the building, Michael walked fast, pushing his way through the crowds on the sidewalks, stepping out hard with both hands thrust into his pockets. He didn't look where he was going, but it didn't surprise him when at last he found himself in the main concourse of the Johannesburg railway station. He fetched a paper cup of coffee from the kiosk near the ticket office and took it to his usual seat on one of the benches. He lit a cigarette and raised his eyes towards the domed glass ceiling. The Pierneuf murals were placed so high that very few of the thousands of commuters who passed through the concourse each day ever noticed them. For Michael, they were the essence of the continent, a distillation of all of Africa's immensity and infinite beauty. Like a celestial choir, they sang aloud all that he was trying to convey in clumsy, stumbling sentences. He felt at peace when at last he left the massive stone building. He found Des Blake on his usual stool at the end of the bar counter at the George. "'Are you your brother's keeper?' Des Blake inquired loftily. But his words were slurred. It took a great deal of gin to make Des Blake slur. "'The sub is asking for you,' Michael lied. He wondered why he felt any concern for the man, or why any of them bothered to protect him. But then one of the other senior journalists had given him the answer to that. He was once a great newspaperman, and we have to look after our own. Des was having difficulty fitting a cigarette into his ivory holder. Michael did it for him, and as he held a match, he said, uh, Come on, Mr. Blake, they're waiting for you. Courtney, I think I should warn you, you know. You, you haven't got what it takes, I'm afraid. You, you'll never cut the mustard, boy. You're just a poor little rich man's son. You'll never be a newspaperman's anus. Come along, Mr. Blake, said Michael wearily, and took his arm to help him down off the stool. The first thing Michael noticed when he reached his desk again was that the sheet of paper was missing from his typewriter. It was only in the last few months, since he had been assigned to work with Des Blake, that he had been given his own desk and machine, and he was fiercely jealous and protective of them. The idea of anyone fiddling with his typewriter, let alone taking work out of him, infuriated him. He looked around him furiously, seeking a target for his anger, but every single person in the long, crowded, noisy room was senior to him. 
The effort it cost him to contain his outrage left him shaking. He lit another cigarette, the last one in his pack, and even in his agitation he realised that that made it twenty since breakfast. Courtney! The sub called across to him, raising his voice above the rattle of typewriters. You took your time. Mr Herbstein wants you in his office right away. Michael's rage subsided miraculously. He had never been in the editor's office before. Mr Herbstein had once said good morning to him in the lift, but that was all. The walk down the newsroom seemed the longest of his life, and though nobody even glanced up as he passed, Michael was certain that they were secretly sniggering at him and gloating on his dilemma. He knocked on the frosted glass panel of the editor's door, and there was a bellow from inside. Timidly, Michael pushed the door open and peered round it. Leon Herbstein was on the telephone. A burly man in a sloppy, hand-knitted cardigan with thick horn-rimmed spectacles and a shock of thick curly hair shot through with strands of grey. Impatiently, he waved Michael into the room and then ignored him while he finished his conversation on the telephone. At last, he slammed down the receiver and swivelled his chair to regard the young man who was standing uneasily in front of his desk. Ten days before... Leon Herbstein had received a quite unexpected invitation to a luncheon in the executive dining room of the Courtney Mining and Finance Company's new head office building. There had been ten other guests present, all of them leaders of commerce and industry, but Herbstein had found himself in the right-hand seat beside his host. Leon Herbstein had never had any great admiration for Shaza Courtney. He was suspicious of vast wealth, and the two Courtneys, mother and son, had a formidable reputation for shrewd and ruthless business practices. Then again, Shaza Courtney had forsaken the United Party, of which Leon Herbstein was an ardent supporter, and had gone across to the Nationalists. Leon Herbstein had never forgotten the violent anti-Semitism which had attended the birth of the National Party, and he considered the policy of apartheid as simply another manifestation of the same grotesque racial bigotry. As far as he was concerned, Shaza Courtney was one of the enemy. However, he sat down at his luncheon table, quite unprepared for the man's easy and insidious charm and his quick and subtle mind. Shaza devoted most of his attention to Leon Herbstein, and by the end of the meal the editor had considerably moderated his feelings towards the Courtneys. At least he was convinced that Shaza Courtney truly had the best interests of all the people at heart, that he was especially concerned with improving the lot of the black and underprivileged sections, and that he was wielding an important moderating influence in the high councils of the National Party. In addition, he left the Courtney building with a heightened respect for Shaza Courtney's subtlety. Not once had Shaza mentioned the fact that he and his companies now owned 42% of the stock of Associated Newspapers of South Africa, or that his son was employed as a junior journalist on the mail. It hadn't been necessary. Both men had been acutely aware of these facts while they talked. Up to that time, Leon Herbstein had felt a natural antagonism towards Michael Courtney. Placing him in the care of Des Blake had been all the preference he had shown to the lad. However, after that luncheon, he'd begun to study him with more attention. It didn't take an old dog long to attribute the improvement in much of the copy that Des Blake had been turning out recently to the groundwork that Michael Courtney was doing for him. From then onwards, whenever he passed Michael's desk, Herbstein made a point of quickly and surreptitiously checking what work was in his machine or in the copy basket. Herbstein had the journalist's trick of being able to assimilate a full typed sheet at a single glance and he was grimly amused to notice how often Des Blake's column was based on the draft by his young assistant, and how often the original was better than the final copy. Now he studied Michael closely as he stood awkwardly before his desk. Despite the fact that he had cropped his hair in one of those appalling brush cuts that the youth were affecting these days, and wore a vividly patterned bow tie, he was a likeable-looking lad, with a strong, determined jawline and clear, intelligent eyes. Perhaps he was too thin for his height and a little gawky, but he had quite noticeably matured and gained in self-assurance during the short period he had been at the mail. Suddenly Leon realised that he was being cruel and that his scrutiny 
was subjecting the lad to unnecessary agony. He picked up the sheet of typescript that lay in front of him and slid it across his untidy desk. Did you write that? he demanded gruffly, and Michael snatched up the sheet protectively. But I didn't mean anybody to read it, he whispered, and then remembered who he was talking to and threw in a lame, sir. Strange, Leon Herbstein shook his head. I always believed we were in the business of writing so that others could read. I was just practising. Michael held the sheet behind his back. I made some corrections, Herbstein told him. And Michael jerked the page out from behind him and scanned it anxiously. Your third paragraph is redundant, and scar is a better word than kekatrice. Otherwise, we'll run it as you wrote it. I don't understand, sir. You've saved me the trouble of writing tomorrow's editorial. Herbstein reached across and took the page from Michael's limp fingers, tossed it into his outbasket, and then concentrated all his attention on his own work. Michael stood gaping at the top of his head. It took him ten seconds to realise that he had been dismissed, and he backed towards the door and closed it carefully behind him. His legs just carried him to his desk, and then collapsed under him. He sat down heavily in his swivel chair and reached for his cigarette pack. It was empty. He crumpled it and dropped it into his waste paper basket. Only then did the full significance of what had happened hit him, and he felt cold and slightly nauseated. The editorial, he whispered, and his hands began to tremble. Across the desk, Desmond Blake belched softly and demanded, Where are the notes on that American uh, what's his name fellow? Uh, I haven't finished it yet, Mr. Blake. Listen, kid, I warned you, you will have to extract your digit from your fundamental orifice if you want to get anywhere around here. Michael set his alarm clock for five o'clock the next morning and went downstairs with his raincoat over his pyjamas. He was waiting on the street corner with the newspaper urchins when the bundles of newsprint were tossed onto the pavement from the back of the mail's delivery van. He ran back up the stairs, clutching a copy of the paper, and locked the door to his bedsitter. It took all his courage to open it at the editorial page. He was actually shaking with terror that Mr Herbstein might have changed his mind, or that it was all some monstrous practical joke. There, under the mail's crest, at the very top of the editorial page, was his headline. A martyr is born. He read it through quickly, and then started again and read it aloud, mouthing each word, rolling it over his tongue like a noble and precious wine. He dropped the paper, opened at the editorial, beside the mirror while he shaved, and then carried it down to the Greek fast-food cafe where he had his breakfast each morning, and showed it to Mr Costa, who called his wife out of the kitchen. Hey, Michael, you big shot now! Mrs Costa embraced him, smelling of fried bacon and garlic. You are big shot newspaperman now! She let him use the telephone in the back room, and he gave the operator the number at Veltefrieden. Santan answered on the second ring. Mickey, she cried delightedly. Where are you? Are you in Cape Town? He calmed her down and then read it out to her. There was a long silence. The editorial, Mickey? You aren't making this up, are you? I'll never forgive you if you are. Once he had reassured her, Santon told him, I can't remember ever being so excited about anything in years. I am going to call your father. You must tell him yourself. Shaza came on the line, and Michael read it to him. You wrote that? Shaza asked. Pretty hot stuff, Mickey. Of course, I don't agree with your conclusions. Gama must hang. However, you almost convinced me otherwise, but we can debate that when next we are together. In the meantime, congratulations, my boy. Perhaps you did make the right decision after all. Michael found that he was a minor celebrity in the newsroom. Even the sub stopped by his desk to congratulate him and discuss the article for a few moments. And the pretty little blonde on the reception desk, who had never before been aware of his existence, smiled and greeted him by name. Listen, kid, said Desmond Blake, one little fart doesn't make a whole sewage farm. In future, I don't want you pushing copy over my head. Every bit of shit you write comes across my desk. Get it? I'm sorry, Mr. Blake, I didn't... Yeah, yeah, I know you didn't mean it. 
Just don't go getting a big head. Remember whose assistant you are. The news of Moses Garma's reprieve threw the newsroom into a state of pandemonium that didn't subside for almost a week. Michael was drawn in, and some of his days ended at midnight when the presses started their run and began when the first papers hit the streets the next morning. However, he found that the excitement seemed to release limitless reserves of energy in him, and he never felt tired. He learned to work quickly and accurately, and his way with words gradually assumed a deftness and polish that was apparent even to himself. Two weeks after the reprieve, the editor called him into his office. He had learned not to knock. Any waste of time irritated Leon Herbstein and made him bellow aggressively. Michael went straight on in, but he had not yet entirely mastered the pose of world-weary cynicism, which he knew was the hallmark of the veteran journalist. And he was all radiant eagerness as he asked, uh, Yes, Mr Herbstein? OK, Mickey, I've got something for you. Every time Mr Herbstein used his Christian name, Michael still thrilled with delicious shock. We're getting a lot of requests from readers and overseas correspondents. With all the interest in the Gama case, people want to know more about the black political movements. They want to know the difference between the Pan-Africanist Congress and the African National Congress. They want to know who's who. Who the hell are Tambu and Sisulu, Mandela and Moses Gama? And what do they stand for? All that sort of stuff. You seem to be interested in black politics and enjoy digging around in the archives. Besides, I can't spare one of my top men on this sort of background stuff. So get on with it. Herbstein switched his attention back to the work on his desk, but Michael by now had sufficient confidence to stand his ground. Am I still working under Mr Blake? he asked. He had learned by this time, if you called him sir, it just made Leon Herbstein mad. Herbstein shook his head but did not even look up. You're on your own. Send everything to me. No hurry. Any time in the next five minutes will do nicely. Michael soon discovered that the mail's archives were inadequate and served merely to initiate him into the complexity and daunting size of the project he had been set. However, from them he was at least able to draw up a list of the various black political groups and related associations such as the officially unrecognised black trade unions and from there to compile a list of their own leaders and officials. He cleared one wall of his bed sitting room and put up a board on which he pinned all this information, using different coloured cards for each grouping and press photographs of the principal black leaders. All this achieved was to convince him of how little was known about the black movements by even the most well-informed of the white section of the nation. The public library added very little to his understanding. Most of the books on the subject had been written ten or more years before, and simply traced the African National Congress from those distant days of its inception in 1912, and the names mentioned were all of men who were now dead or in their dotage. Then he had his first inspiration. One of the male's sister publications, under the banner of Associated Newspapers of South Africa, was a weekly magazine called Asagai, after the broad-bladed war spear that the impies of Shaka the Zulu conqueror had wielded. The magazine was aimed at the educated and more affluent section of the black community. Its editorial policy was dictated by the white directors of associated newspapers, but amongst the articles and photographs of African football stars and torch singers, of black American athletes and film actors, an occasional article slipped through of a fiercely radical slant. Michael borrowed a company car and went out to see the editor of Asagai in the vast black location of Drake's farm. The editor was a graduate of the Black University of Fort Hare, a causer named Solomon Nduli. He was polite but cool, and they had chatted for half an hour before a barbed remark let Michael know that he had been recognised as a spy for the security police and that he would learn nothing of value. A week later, the Mail published the first of Michael's articles in its Saturday magazine edition. It was a comparison of the two leading African political organisations. The Pan-Africanist Congress, which was a jealously exclusive body to which only pure-blooded African blacks were admitted, 
and whose views were extremely radical, and the much larger African National Congress, which, although predominantly black, also included whites and Asians and mixed-blood members such as the Cape Coloureds, and whose objectives were essentially conciliatory. The article was accurate, obviously carefully researched, but, most important, the tone was sympathetic, and it carried the byline by Michael Courtney. The following day, Solomon and Dooley called Michael at the offices of the mail and suggested another meeting. His first words when they shook hands were, ah, I am sorry, I think I misjudged you. What do you want to know? Solomon took Michael into a strange world that he had never realised existed, the world of the black townships. He arranged for him to meet Robert Sabuque, and Michael was appalled by the depth of the resentment the black leader of the Pan-Africanist Congress expressed, particularly for the pass laws, by his enormous impatience to the effect an upheaval of the entire society, and by the thinly veiled violence in the man. Uh, I will try for you to meet uh, Mandela, Solomon promised, although, as you know, he is underground now and wanted by the police, but there are others you must talk to. He took Michael to Baraguanath Hospital and introduced him to the wife of Moses Gama, the lovely young Zulu woman he had seen at the trial in Cape Town. Victoria was heavily pregnant, but with a calm dignity that impressed Michael deeply until he sensed the same terrible resentment and latent violence in her that he had found in Robert Sabuque. The next day, Solomon took him back to Drake's farm to meet a man named Hendrik Tabaka, a man who seemed to own most of the small businesses in the location and looked like a heavyweight wrestler, with a head like a cannonball, crisscrossed with scars. He appeared to Michael to represent the opposite end of the black protest consciousness. I have my family and my business, he told Michael, and I will protect them from anybody, black or white. And Michael was reminded of a view that his father had often expressed, but to which Michael had not given much consideration before this. We must give the black people a piece of the pie, Shaza Courtney had said. Give them something of their own. The truly dangerous man is one with nothing to lose. Michael gave the second article in the series, the title Rage. And in it, he tried to describe the deep and bitter resentment that he had encountered on his journeys into the half-world of the townships. He ended the article with the words, Despite this deep sense of outrage, I never found the least indication of hatred towards the white person as an individual by any of the black leaders with whom I was able to speak. Their resentment seemed to me to be directed only at the nationalist government's policy of apartheid, while the vast treasure of mutual goodwill built up over 300 years between the races seems to be entirely undiminished by it. He delivered the article to Leon Herbstein on the Thursday and found himself immediately embroiled in an editorial review that lasted until almost eight o'clock that evening. Leon Herbstein called in his assistant and his deputy editor, and their views were divided between publishing with only minor alterations and not publishing at all, for fear of bringing down the wrath of the publication's control board, the government censors who had the power to ban the mail and put it out of business. But it's all true, Michael protested. I have substantiated every single fact I have quoted. It's true and it's important. That is all that really matters. And the three older journalists looked at him pityingly. All right, Mickey, Leon Herbstein dismissed him at last. You can go home now. I'll let you know the final decision in due course. As Michael moved dispiritedly towards the door, the deputy editor nodded at him. Publish or not, Mickey, it's a damned good effort. You can be proud of it. When Michael got back to his apartment, he found somebody sitting on a canvas hold-all outside his front door. Only when the person stood up did he recognise the massively developed shoulders, the glinting steel-rimmed spectacles and spiky hairstyle. Gary! he shouted joyously and rushed to embrace his elder brother. They sat side by side on the bed and talked excitedly, interrupting each other and laughing and exclaiming at each other's news. What are you doing in Joburg? Michael demanded at last. I've come up from the Silver River just for the weekend. I want to get at the new computer mainframe in head office. 
and there are a few things I want to check at the land surveyor's office. So I thought, what the hell, why spend money on a hotel when Mickey has a flat? So I brought my sleeping bag. Can I doss on your floor? Oh, the bed pulls out into a double, Mickey told him happily. You don't have to sleep on the floor. They went down to Costa's restaurant, and Gary bought a pack of chicken curry and half a dozen Cokes. They ate the food out of the pack, sharing a spoon to save washing up, and they talked until long after midnight. They had always been very close to each other. Even though he was younger, Michael had been a staunch ally during those dreadful childhood years of Gary's bedwetting and stuttering and Sean's casually savage bullying. Then again, Michael had not truly realised how lonely he had been in this strange city until this moment, and now there were so many nostalgic memories and so much unrequited need for affection to assuage so many subjects of earth-shattering importance to discuss, they sat up into the small hours dealing with money and work and sex and the rest of it. Gary was stunned to learn that Michael earned thirty-seven pounds and ten shillings a month. Uh, how much does this kennel cost you a month? he demanded. Twenty pounds, Michael told him. That leaves you seventeen pounds ten a month to eat and exist. They should be arrested for slave labour. It's not as bad as that. Pater gives me an allowance to make do. How much do you earn, Gary? Michael demanded, and Gary looked guilty. I get my board and lodging and all my meals at the mine, single quarters, and I'm paid a hundred a month as an executive trainee. Son of a gun! Michael was deeply impressed. What do you do with all that? It was Gary's turn to look amazed. Save it, of course. I've got over two thousand in the bank already. But what are you going to do with all that? Michael insisted. What are you going to spend it on? Money isn't for spending, Gary explained. Money is for saving. That is, if you want to be rich. And you want to be rich? What else is there? Gary was genuinely puzzled by the question. What about doing an important job the best way you can? Isn't that something to strive for? Even better than getting rich? Oh, sure, said Gary with vast relief. But then, of course, you won't get rich unless you do just that. It was almost two in the morning when Michael at last switched off the bedside lamp, and they settled down nose to toes, until Gary asked in the darkness the question he had not been able to ask until then. Mickey, have you heard from Mater at all? Michael was silent for so long that he went on impetuously. I have tried to speak to Dad about her, but he just clams up and won't say a word. Same with Nana. Except she went a little further. She said, "Don't mention that woman's name in Veltafrieden again. She was responsible for Blaine's murder. I thought you might know where she is. She's in London," Michael said softly. "She writes to me every week. Oh, when is she coming back, Mickey? Never," Michael said. "She and Peter are getting a divorce. Why, Mickey? What happened that she had to leave like that without even saying goodbye?" I don't know. She won't say. I wrote and asked her, but she wouldn't tell me. Gary thought he had gone to sleep, but after a long silence, Michael said so softly that he barely caught the words. I miss her, Gary. Oh God, how much I miss her. Me too," said Gary dutifully. But each week that passed was so filled with excitement and new experience that for Gary, her memory had already faded and blurred. The next morning, Leon Herbstein called Mickey into his office. "Okay, Mickey," he said, "we're going to run the Rage article as you wrote it." Only then did Michael realize how important that decision had been to him. For the rest of that day, his jubilation was tempered by that reflection. Why was his feeling of relief so powerful? Was it the personal achievement, the thought of seeing his name in print again? It was part of that. He was honest with himself. But there was something else, even deeper and more substantial. The truth. He had written the truth, and the truth had prevailed. He had been exonerated. Michael went down early the next morning and brought a copy of the mail up to the bedsitter. He woke Gary up and read the rage feature to him. Gary had only come in a few hours before dawn. He had spent most of the night in the computer room at the new Courtney Mining Building in Diagonal Street. David Abrams, on Shaza's discreet suggestion, 
had arranged for him to have a free hand with the equipment when it was not being used on company business. This morning Gary was red-eyed with exhaustion and his jowls were covered with a dense dark pelt of new beard. However, he sat up in his pyjamas and listened with attention while Michael read to him. And when he had finished, Gary put on his spectacles and sat solemnly reading it through for himself while Michael brewed coffee on the gas ring in the corner. It's funny, isn't it? Gary said at last. How we just take them for granted. They are there, working the shifts at the Silver River, or harvesting the grapes at Veltafrieden, or waiting on table. But you never think of them as actually having feelings and desires and thoughts the same as we do. Not until you read something like this. Thank you, Gary, Michael said softly. What for? That's the greatest compliment anybody has ever paid me, Michael said. He saw very little more of Gary that weekend. Gary spent the Saturday morning at the Deeds Registry until that office closed at noon and then went on up to the Courtney building to take over the computer as soon as the company programmers went off for their weekend. He let himself back into the flat at three the next morning and climbed into the bottom end of Michael's bed. When they both awoke late on the Sunday morning, Michael suggested, Let's go out to Zoo Lake. It's a hot day and the girls will be out in their sundresses. He offered the bait deliberately, for he was desperate for Gary's company, lonely and suffering from a sense of anticlimax after all the worry and uncertainty previous to the printing of the Rage article and the subsequent apparent lack of any reaction to it. Oh, hey, Mickey, I'd love to come with you, but I want to do something on the computer. It's Sunday, I'll have the day to myself. Gary looked mysterious and self-satisfied. You see, I'm onto something, Mickey, something incredible. And I can't stop now. Alone, Michael caught the bus out to Zoo Lake. He spent the day sitting on the lawns, reading and watching the girls. It only made him feel even more lonely and insignificant. When he got back to his dreary little flatlet, Gary's bag was gone, and there was a message written with soap on his shaving mirror. Going back to Silver River. Might see you next weekend. G. When Michael walked into the mail's offices on the Monday morning, he found that those members of the newspaper staff who had arrived ahead of him were gathered in a silent, nervous cluster in the middle of the newsroom, while half a dozen strangers were going through the filing cabinets and rifling the papers and books on the desks. They had already assembled a dozen large cardboard cartons of various papers, and these were stacked in the aisle between the desks. "'What's happening?' Michael asked innocently and his sub gave him a warning glance as he explained. These are police officers of the security branch. Who are you? The plainclothes officer, who was in charge of the detail, came across to Michael. And when he gave his name, the officer checked his list. Ah, yes. You're the one we want. Come with me. He led Michael down to Leon Herbstein's office and went in without knocking. There was another stranger with Herbstein. Yes, what is it? He snapped, and the security policeman answered diffidently. This is the one, Captain. The stranger frowned at Michael, but before he could speak, Leon Herbstein interrupted quickly. It's all right, Michael. The police have come to serve a banning order on the Saturday edition with the Rage article in it, and they have a warrant to search the offices. They also want to talk to you, but it's nothing to worry about. Don't be too sure of that, said the police captain heavily. Are you the one who wrote that piece of commie propaganda? I wrote the Rage article, Michael said clearly. But Leon Herbstein cut in. However, as the editor of the Golden City Mail, it was my decision to print it, and I accept full responsibility for the article. The captain ignored him and studied Michael for a moment before going on. Man, you're just a kid. What do you know, anyway? I object to that, Captain, Herbstein told him angrily. Mr. Courtney is an accredited journalist. He are, the captain nodded. I expect that he is. But he went on addressing Michael. What about you? Do you object to coming down to Marshall Square Police Headquarters to help us with our investigations? Michael glanced at Herbstein, and he said immediately, You don't have to go, Michael. They don't have a warrant for your arrest. What do you want from me, Captain? Michael hedged. We want to know who told you all that treasonable stuff you wrote about. I can't disclose my sources, Michael said quietly. I can always get a warrant if you refuse to cooperate, the captain warned him ominously. 
I'll come with you, Michael agreed, but I won't disclose my sources. That's not ethical. I'll be down there with a lawyer right away, Michael, Herbstein promised. You don't have to worry. The mail will back you all the way. All right, let's go, said the police captain. Leon Herbstein accompanied Michael down the newsroom, and as they passed the cartons of impounded literature, the captain observed gloatingly, Man, you've got a pile of banned stuff there, Karl Marx and Trotsky even. That's really poisonous rubbish. It's research material, said Leon Herbstein. Yeah, I'll try telling that to the magistrate, the captain chortled. As soon as the doors of the elevator closed on the captain and Michael, Herbstein trotted heavily back to his office and snatched up the telephone. I want an urgent call to Mr. Shaza Courtney in Cape Town. Try his home at Veltafrieden, his office in Santown House, and his ministerial office at the Houses of Parliament. He got through to Shaza in his parliamentary suite, and Shaza listened in silence while Herbstein explained to him what had happened. All right, Shaza said crisply at the end of it. You get the Associated Newspaper's lawyers down to Marshall Square immediately. Then ring David Abrams at Courtney Mining and tell him what has happened. Tell him I want a massive reaction. Everything we've got. Tell him also that I'll be flying up immediately in the company jet. I want a limousine at the airport to meet me, and I will go to see the Minister of Police at the Union Buildings in Pretoria the minute I arrive. Even Leon Herbstein, who had seen it all before, was impressed by the mobilisation of the vast resources of the Courtney Empire. At ten o'clock that evening, Michael Courtney was released from interrogation on the direct orders of the Minister of Police, and when he walked out of the front entrance of Marshall Square headquarters, he was flanked by half a dozen lawyers of formidable reputation who had been retained by Courtney Mining and Associated Newspapers. At the pavement, Shaza Courtney was waiting in the back seat of the black Cadillac limousine. As Michael climbed in beside him, he said grimly, It is possible, Mickey, to be a bit too bloody clever for your own good. Just what the hell are you trying to do? Burn down everything that we've worked for all our lives? What I wrote was the truth. I thought you of all people would understand, Peter. What you wrote, my boy, is incitement. Taken by the wrong people and used on simple, ignorant black folk, your words could help to open a Pandora's box of horrors. I want no more of that sort of thing from you. Do you hear me, Michael? I hear you, Peter, Michael said softly. But I can't promise to obey you. I'm sorry, but I have to live with my own conscience. Oh, you're as bad as your bloody mother, said Shaza. He had sworn twice in as many minutes, the first time in his life that Michael had ever heard his father use coarse language. That and the mention of his mother, also the first time Shaza had done so since she left, silenced Michael completely. They drove without speaking to the Carlton Hotel. Shaza only spoke again when they were in his permanent suite. All right, Mickey, he said with resignation. I take that back. I can't demand that you live your life on my terms. Follow your conscience if you must, but don't expect me to come rushing in to save you from the consequences of your actions every time. I have never expected that, sir, Michael said carefully, and I won't in future either. He paused and swallowed hard. But all the same, sir, I want to thank you for what you did. You have always been so good to me. Oh, Mickey, Mickey, Shaza cried, shaking his head sorrowfully. If only I could give you the experience I earned with so much pain. If only you didn't have to make exactly the same mistakes I made at your age. I'm always grateful for your advice, Peter. Michael tried to placate him. All right, then, here's a piece for nothing, Shaza told him. When you meet an invincible enemy, you don't rush headlong at him, swinging with both fists. That way you merely get your neck broken. What you do is you sneak around behind him and kick him in the backside, then run like hell. I'll remember that, sir, Michael grinned, and Shaza put his arm around his shoulders. I know you smoke like a bushfire, but can I offer you a drink, my boy? I'll have a beer, sir. Beer, sir. Beer, sir. Beer, sir. Beer, sir. The next day, Michael drove out to visit Solomon Dooley at Drake's farm. He wanted to have his views on the Rage article and tell him of the consequences he had suffered at Marshall Square. That was not necessary. Solomon and Dooley somehow knew every detail of his detention and interrogation 
and Michael found he was a celebrity at the offices of Asagai magazine. Nearly every one of the black journalists and magazine staff wanted to shake his hand and congratulate him on the article. As soon as they were alone in his office, Solomon told him excitedly, Nelson Mandela has read your piece, and he wants to meet you. But he's with the police. He's on the run. After what you wrote, he trusts you, Solomon said, and so does Robert Sabukwe. He also wants to see you again. Then he noticed Michael's expression, and the excitement went out of him as he asked quietly, Unless you think it's too dangerous for you. Michael hesitated only a moment. No, of course not. I want to meet them both. Very much. Solomon and Dooley said nothing. He simply reached across the desk and clasped Michael's shoulder. It was strange what a pleasurable sensation that grip gave Michael, the first comradely gesture he had ever received from a black man. Shaza banked the HS-125 twin-engine jet to give himself a better view of the Silver River mine a thousand feet below. The headgear was of modern design, not the traditional scaffolding of steel girders with the great steel wheels of the haulage exposed. It was instead a graceful, unbroken tower of concrete, tall as a ten-storey building, and around it the other buildings of the mine complex, the crushing works and uranium extraction plant, and the gold refinery had been laid out with equal aesthetic consideration. The administration block was surrounded by green lawns and flowering gardens, and beyond that, there were an 18-hole golf course, a cricket pitch, and a rugby field for the white miners. An Olympic-sized swimming pool adjoined the mine club and single quarters. On the opposite side of the property stood the compound for the black mine workers. Here again, Schauser had ordered that the traditional rows of barracks be replaced by neat cottages for the senior black staff, and the bachelor quarters were spacious and pleasant, more like motels, and institutions to house and feed the 5,000 tribesmen who had been recruited from as far afield as Nyasaland in the north and Portuguese Mozambique in the east. There were also soccer fields and cinemas and a shopping complex for the black employees, and between the buildings were green lawns and trees. The Silver River was a wet mine, and each day millions of gallons of water were pumped out of the deep workings, and these were used to beautify the property. Shaza had reason to be proud. Although the main shaft had intersected the gold-bearing reef at great depth, more than a mile below the surface, still the ore was so rich that it could be brought to the surface for enormous profit. What's more, the price could not be pegged at $35 per ounce for much longer. Shaza was convinced that it would double and even treble. Our guardian angel, Shaza smiled to himself as he levelled the wings of the HS-125 and began his preparations for the landing. Of all the blessings that have been heaped upon this land, gold is the greatest. It has stood us through the bad times and made the good times glorious. It is our treasure and more. For when all else fails, when our enemies and the fates conspire to bring us down, gold glows with its bright particular lustre to protect us. A guardian angel indeed. Although the company pilot in the right-hand seat watched critically, for Shaza had only converted to jets within the last twelve months, Shaza brought the swift machine into the long blue tarmac strip with casual ease. The HS-125 was painted in silver and blue, with the stylized diamond logo on the fuselage, just as the old Mosquito had been. It was a magnificent machine. With its seating for eight passengers and its blazing speed, it was infinitely more practical than the Mosquito. But Shaza still occasionally mourned her loss. He had flown over 5,000 hours in the old Mosquito, before at last donating her to the Air Force Museum, where, restored to her combat camouflage and armaments, she was one of the prime exhibits. Shaza rolled the glistening new jet down to the hangar at the far end of the strip, and reception committee was out to meet him, headed by the general manager of the silver mine, all of them holding their ears against the shrill wail of the engines. The general manager shook Shaza's hand and said immediately, Your son asked me to apologise that he wasn't able to meet you, Mr Courtney. He's underground at the moment, but asked me to tell you he'll come up to the guest house as soon as he gets off shift. The general manager, emboldened by Shaza's smile of paternal approval, risked a pleasantry. 
It must run in the family, but it's difficult to get the little blighter to stop working. We almost have to tie him down. There were two guest houses, one for other important visitors to the mine, and this one set aside exclusively for Shaza and Santan. It was so sybaritic, and had cost so much, that embarrassing questions had been put to Shaza at the annual general meeting of the company by a group of dissident shareholders. Shaza was totally unrepentant. How can I work properly if I'm not allowed at least some basic comforts? A roof over my head. Is that too much to ask? The guest house had its own squash court and heated indoor pool, cinema, conference room, kitchens and wine cellar. The design was by one of Frank Lloyd Wright's most brilliant pupils, and Hicks had come out from London to do the interior. It housed the overflow of Shaza's art collection and Persian carpets from Weltefrieden, and the mature trees in the landscape garden had been selected from all over the country to be replanted here. Shaza felt very much at home in this little pied à terre. The underground engineer and the chief electrical engineer were already waiting in the conference room, and Shaza went straight in and was at work within ten minutes of landing the jet. By eight o'clock that evening, he had exhausted his engineers, and he let them go. Gary was waiting next door in Shaza's private study, filling in the time playing with the computer terminal, but he leapt up as Shaza walked in. Dad, I'm so glad I've found you. I've been trying to catch up with you for days. I'm running out of time. He was stuttering again. These days he only did that when he was wildly overexcited. Slow down, Gary, slow down. Take a deep breath, Shaza advised him. But the words kept tumbling out, and Gary seized his father's hand and led him to the computer to illustrate what he was trying to put across. You know what Nana has always said, and what you were always telling me about land being the only lasting asset? Well, Gary's powerful spatulate fingers rippled over the computer keys. Shaza watched with curiosity as Gary presented his case. But when he realised what the boy was driving at, he quickly lost interest and concentration. However, he listened to it all before he asked quietly, So you've paid for the option with your own money? I have it signed here, Gary brandished the document. It cost me all my savings, over £2,000, just for a one-week option. Let me recap then, Shaza suggested. You have spent £2,000 to acquire a one-week option on a section of agricultural ground on the northern outskirts of Johannesburg, which you intend to develop as a residential township, complete with a shopping complex, theatres, cinemas and all the trimmings. There's at least £20 million of profit in the development. At the very least, Gary manipulated the computer keyboard and pointed to the rippling green figures. Just look at that, Dad. Gary, Gary, Shaza sighed. I think you've just lost your £2,000, but the experience will be worth it in the long run. Of course there is a £20 million profit in it. Everybody knows that, and everybody wants a piece of that action. It's just for that reason that there is such strict control on township development. It takes at least five years to get government approval for a new township, and there are hundreds of pitfalls along the way. It's a highly complex and specialised field of investment, and the outlay is enormous, millions of pounds at risk. Don't you see, Gary? Your piece of land is probably not the best available. There will be a dozen other projects ahead of yours, and township development just isn't one of the areas which we deal in. Shaza broke off and stared at his son. Gary was flapping his hands and stuttering so badly that Shaza had to warn him again. Big breath! Gary gasped and his barrel chest expanded until his shirt button strained. It came out clearly. I already have approval, he said. That takes years, I've explained. Shaza was brusque. He began to rise. Oh, we should change for dinner. Come on. Dad, Dad, you don't understand, Gary insisted. Approval has already been granted. Shaza sat down slowly. What did you say? He asked quietly. Township approval was granted in 1891 by the Volksrat of the old Transvaal Republic. It was signed by President Kruger himself but it is still perfectly legal and binding. It was just forgotten, that's all. I don't believe it. Shaza shook his head. How on earth did you get onto this, Gary? I was reading a couple of old books about the early days of the Vitvatersrand and the gold mines. I thought that if I was going to learn mining, the very least I could do was bone up on the history of the industry, Gary explained. And in one of the books, 
there was a mention of one of the old Rand Lords and his grandiose idea of building a paradise city for the very rich, away from the coarse and rowdy centre of Johannesburg. The author mentioned that he had actually bought a 6,000-acre farm and had it surveyed, and that approval had been granted by the Volksrat, and then the whole idea had been abandoned. Well, what did you do then? I went to the archives and I looked up the proceedings of the Volksrat for the years 1889 to 1891, and there it was, the approval. Then I researched the title deeds of the property at the deeds registry and went out to the farm itself. It's called Buffyance Fontaine, and it's owned by two brothers, both in their 70s. Nice old fellows. We got on well, and they showed me their horses and cattle and invited me to lunch. They thought the option was a big joke, but when I showed them my £2,000, they had never seen so much money in one pile in their lives. Gary grinned. Here are copies of the title deeds and the original township approval. Gary handed them to his father, and Shaza read through slowly, even moving his lips like a semi-literate, so as to savour every word of the ancient documents. When does your option expire? he asked at last, without looking up. Noon on Thursday. We'll have to act fast. Did you take out the option in the name of Courtney Mining? Shaza asked. No, in my own name, but of course I did it for you and the company. You thought this out alone, Shaza said carefully. You researched it yourself, dug up the original approval, negotiated the option with the owners, paid for it with 2,000 of your own hard-earned cash. You did all the work and took all the risks, and now you want to hand it over to someone else. That isn't very bright, is it? I don't want to hand it over to just anybody. To you, Dad. Everything I do is for you, you know that. Well, that changes as of now, said Shaza briskly. I will personally lend you the 200,000 purchase price, and we will fly up to Johannesburg first thing tomorrow to clinch the deal. Once you own the land, Courtney Mining will begin negotiating with you the terms of a joint venture to develop it. The negotiations started tough. And then, as Gary got his first taste of blood, they grew tougher. My God, I've sired a monster, Shaza complained, to hide his pride in his offspring's bargaining technique. Come on, son, leave something in it for us. To mollify his father a little, Gary announced a change in the name of the property. In future, it would be known as Shazaville. When they at last signed the final agreement, Shaza opened a bottle of champagne and said, Congratulations, my boy. That approbation was worth more to Gary than all the townships and every grain of gold on the Witwatersrand. Zrud. 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 Lothar de la Rey was one of the youngest police captains on the force, and this was not entirely on account of his father's position and influence. From the time he had been awarded the Sword of Honour at Police College, he had distinguished himself in every field that was considered important by the higher command. He had studied for and passed all his promotion examinations with distinction. A great emphasis was placed on athletic endeavour, and rugby football was the major sport in the police curriculum. It was now almost certain that Lothar would be chosen as an international during the forthcoming tour by the New Zealand All Blacks. He was well liked by both senior officers and peers, and his service record was embellished by an unbroken string of excellent ratings. Added to this, he had shown an unusual aptitude for police work. Neither the plodding monotony of investigation nor the routine of patrol wearied him, and in those sudden eruptions of dangerous and violent action, Lothar had displayed resourcefulness and courage. He had four citations on his service record, all of them for successful confrontation with dangerous criminals. He was also the holder of the Police Medal for Gallantry, which he had been awarded after he had shot and killed two notorious drug dealers during a foot chase through the Black Township at night, and a single-handed shootout from which he had emerged unscathed. Added to all this was the assessment by his superiors that while himself amenable to discipline, he had the qualities of command and leadership highly developed. Both these were very much Afrikaner characteristics. During the North African campaign against Rommel, General Montgomery, when told that there was a shortage of officer material, had replied, Nonsense! We've got thousands of South Africans! Each of them is a natural leader. 
From childhood, they are accustomed to giving orders to the natives. Lothar had been stationed at the Sharpville Police Station since graduating from police college and had come to know the area intimately. Gradually, he had built up his own network of informers, the basis of all good police work, and through these prostitutes and shabeen owners and petty criminals, he was able to anticipate much of the serious crime and to identify the organisers and perpetrators even before the offence was committed. The higher command of the police force was well aware that the young police captain with illustrious family connections was in a large measure responsible for the fact that the police in the Sharpville location had, over the past few years, built up a reputation of being one of the most vigorous and active units in the heavily populated industrial triangle that lies between Johannesburg, Pretoria and Vereniging. In comparison to Greater Soweto, Alexandra or even Drake's Farm, Sharpville was a small black township. It housed a mere 40,000 or so of all ages, and yet the police raids for illicit liquor and pass offenders were almost a daily routine, and the lists of arrests and convictions, by which the efficiency of any station is judged, were out of all proportion to its size. Much of this industry, and dedication to duty, was quite correctly attributed to the energy of the young second-in-command. Sharpville is an adjunct to the town of Vereniging, where in 1902 the British commander, Lord Kitchener, and the leaders of the Boer commandos negotiated the peace treaty which brought to an end the long, drawn-out and tragic South African War. Vereniging is situated on the Waal, which is a river 50 miles south of Johannesburg, and its reasons for existing are the coal and iron deposits which are exploited by Iskor, the giant state-owned iron and steel corporation. At the turn of the century, the black workers in the steel industry were originally housed in the top location. But as conditions there became totally inadequate and outmoded, a new location was set aside for them in the early 1940s and named after John Sharp, the mayor, for the time being, of the town of Vereniging. As the new dwellings in Sharpville became available, the population was moved down from top location, and although the rents were as high as two pounds seven shillings and sixpence a month, the translocations were effected gradually and peaceably. Sharpville was, in fact, a moral township, and though the cottages were the usual box shape, they were all serviced with waterborne sewerage and electricity, and they were all the other amenities, including a cinema, shopping areas and sports facilities, together with their very own police station. In the midst of one of the most comprehensive pieces of social engineering of the 20th century, which was the policy of apartheid in practice, Sharpville was a remarkable area of calm. All round, hundreds of thousands of people were being moved and regimented and reclassified in accordance with those monumental slabs of legislation, the Group Areas Act and the Population Registration Act. All around the fledgling leaders of black consciousness and liberation were preaching and exhorting and organising, but Sharpville seemed untouched by it all. The white city fathers of Vereniging pointed out with quite justifiable satisfaction that the communist agitators had been given short shrift in the Sharpville location and that their black people were law-abiding and peaceful. The figures for serious crime were amongst the lowest in the industrialised section of the Transvaal, and offenders were taken care of with commendable expedition. Even the rent defaulters were evicted from the location in summary fashion, and the local police force was always cooperative and conscientious. When the law was extended to make it obligatory for black women to carry passes as well as their menfolk, and when throughout most of the country this innovation was strenuously resisted, the ladies of Sharpville presented themselves at the police station in such numbers and in such cooperative spirit that most of them had to be turned away with the injunction to come back later. In early March of 1960, Lothar de la Rey drove his official Land Rover through this stable and law-abiding community, following the wide road across the open space in front of the police station. The cluster of police buildings, in the same austere and utilitarian design as the others in the location, was surrounded by a wire mesh fence about eight feet tall, but the main gates were standing open and unguarded. 
Lothar drove through and parked the Land Rover below the flagpole, on which the orange, blue and white national flag floated on a breeze that carried the faint chemical stink of the blast furnaces at the Iskor plant. In the charge office, he was immediately the centre of attention as his men came to congratulate him on the kick that had won the Curry Cup. Green and gold next, the duty sergeant predicted as he shook Lothar's hand, referring to the colours of the national rugby team jersey. Lothar accepted their admiration with just the right degree of modesty and then put an end to this breach of discipline and routine. All right, all right, back to work, everybody, he ordered and went to check the charge book. Where a charge office in Soweto might expect to have three or four murders and a dozen or so rape cases, there had not been a single Schedule I crime committed in Sharpville during the previous 24 hours, and Lothar nodded with satisfaction and went through to report to his station commander. In the doorway he came to attention and saluted, and the older man nodded and indicated the chair opposite him. Come in, Lothi, sit down. He rocked his chair onto its back legs and watched Lothar as he removed his uniform cap and gloves. Buckhut game on Friday, he congratulated him. Thank you for the tickets, Hellman, that last kick of yours. He felt a stab of envy as he examined his number two. Lieva Lunt, beloved land, but he looked like a soldier. So tall and straight. The commander glanced down at his own slack guts and then back at the way the lad wore his uniform on those wide shoulders. You had only to look at him to see his class. It had taken the commander until the age of 40 to gain the rank of captain, and he was resigned to the fact that he would go on pension at the same rank. But this one, near what? He would probably be a general before he was 40. Well, Lothi, he said heavily, I'm going to miss you. He smiled at the gleam in those alert but strangely pale yellow eyes. Yeah, my young friend, he nodded. Your transfer. You leave us at the end of May. Lothar leaned back in his chair and smiled. He suspected that his own father had been instrumental in keeping him so long on this station. But although it had been increasingly irksome to waste time in this little backwater, his father knew best, and Lothar was grateful for the experience he had gained here. He knew that a policeman only really learns his job on the beat, and he had put in his time. He knew he was a good policeman, and he had proved it to them all. Anybody who might be tempted to attribute his future promotions to his father's influence had only to look at his service record. It was all there. He had paid his dues in full. But now it was time to move on. Where are they sending me, sir? Ach, you lucky dog, the commander shook his head with mock envy. You're going to CID headquarters at Marshall Square. It was the plum. The most sought after, the most prestigious posting that any young officer could hope for. CID headquarters was right in the very nerve centre and heart of the entire force. Lothar knew that from there it would be swift and sure. He would have his general stars while he was still a young man, and with them the maturity and reputation to make his entry into politics smooth and certain. He could retire from the force on the pension of a general and devote the rest of his life to his country and his folk. He had it all planned. Each step was clear to Lothar. When Dr. Furwut went, he knew that his father would be a strong contender to take over the premiership. Perhaps one day there would be a second minister of police with the name Delaray, and after that another Delaray at the head of the nation. He knew what he wanted, what road he had to follow, and he knew also that his feet were securely upon that road. You're being given your chance, Lothi, the commander echoed his own thoughts. If you take it, you'll go far, very far. However far it is, sir, I will always remember the help and encouragement that you have given me here at Sharpville. Ach, enough of that, man. You have a couple of months before you go. The commander was suddenly embarrassed. Neither of them were men who readily displayed their emotions. Ach, man, let's get down to work. Now, what about this raid tonight? How many men are you going to use? Lothar had the headlights of the Land Rover switched off, and he drove slowly, for the four-cylinder petrol engine had a distinctive beat that his quarry would pick up at a distance if the vehicle was driven hard. There was a sergeant beside him, and five constables in the rear of the Land Rover, all of them armed with riot batons. 
In addition, the sergeant had an automatic 12-gauge greener shotgun, and Lothar wore his sidearm on his Sam Brown belt. They were lightly armed, for this was merely a liquor raid. Sale of alcohol to blacks was strictly controlled and was restricted to the brewing of the traditional cereal-based beer by state-controlled beer halls. The consumption of spirits and wines by blacks was forbidden. But this prohibition caused illicit shabines to flourish. The profits were too high to be passed by. The liquor was either stolen or purchased from white bottle stores or manufactured by the shabine owners themselves. These home brews were powerful concoctions, known generally as skokian, and according to the recipe of the individual distiller, could contain anything from methylated spirits to the corpses of poisonous snakes and aborted infants. It was not uncommon for the customers of the shabines to end up permanently blinded or demented, or occasionally dead. Tonight, Lothar's team was setting out to raid a newly established shabine which had been in business for only a few weeks. Lothar's information was that it was controlled by a black gang called the Buffaloes. Of course, Lothar was fully aware of the size and scope of the Buffaloes' operations. They were without doubt the largest and most powerful underworld association on the Witwatersrand. It was not known who headed the gang, but there had been hints that it was connected to the African Mine Workers' Union and to one of the black political organisations. Certainly it was the most active on the gold mining properties closer to Johannesburg and in the large black townships such as Soweto and Drake's Farm. Until now they had not been bothered by the buffaloes here in Sharpville and for this reason the setting up of a controlled shabine was alarming. It might herald a determined infiltration of the area which would almost certainly be followed by a campaign to politicise the local black population with the resulting protest rallies and boycotts of the bus line and white-owned businesses, and all the other trouble whipped up by the agitators of the African National Congress and the newly formed Pan-Africanist Congress. Lothar was determined to crush it before it spread like a bushfire through his whole area. Above the soft burble of the engine, out there in the darkness, he heard a sharp, double-fluted whistle, and almost immediately it was repeated at a distance, down near the end of the avenue of quiet cottages. Machtach, Lothar swore softly but bitterly. They've spotted us. The whistles were the warnings of the Shabine lookouts. He switched on the headlights and gunned the Land Rover. They went hurtling down the narrow street. The Shabine was at the end of the block, in the last cottage hard up against the boundary fence, with a stretch of open felt beyond. As the headlights swept across the front of the cottage, he saw half a dozen dark figures pelting away from it, and others were fighting each other to get out of the front door and leaping from the windows. Lothar swung the Land Rover up over the pavement, through the tiny garden, and braked it into a deliberate and skillfully executed broadside, blocking the front door. Let's go! he yelled, and his men flung the doors open and sprang out. They grabbed the bewildered Shabin drinkers, who were trapped between the Land Rover and the cottage wall. As one of them began to resist, he dropped to a practised swing of a riot baton, and the limp body was bundled into the back of the vehicle. Lothar sprinted around the side of the cottage and caught a woman in his arms as she jumped through the window. He turned her upside down in the air and held onto one ankle as he reached out and seized the arm of the next man through the window. In a single swift motion, he handcuffed the two of them together, wrist to ankle, and left them floundering and falling over each other like a pair of trussed hens. Lothar reached the back door of the cottage and made his first mistake. He seized the handle and jerked the door open. The man had been waiting on the inside, poised and ready. And as the door began to open, he hurled his full weight upon it, and the edge of it crashed into Lothar's chest. The wind was driven from his lungs and hissed up his throat as he went over backwards down the steps, sprawling on the hard, sun-baked earth, and the man leapt clean over him. Lothar caught a glimpse of him against the light, and saw that he was young and well-built, lithe and quick as a black cat. Then he was racing away into the darkness, heading for the boundary fence that backed up to the cottage. Lothar rolled over onto his knees and came to his feet. Even with the start the fugitive had, there was nobody who could outrun Lothar in a fair match. 
he was at the peak of fitness after months of rigorous training for the Curry Cup match and the national trials. But as he started forward, the agony of his empty lungs made him double over and wheeze for breath. Ahead of him, the fleeing figure ducked through a hole in the mesh of the fence, and Lothar fell to his knees and snapped open the holster at his side. Three months before, he had been runner-up in the police pistol championships at Bloemfontein, but now his aim was unsteady with agony, and the dark figure was merging with the night, quartering away from him. Lothar fired twice, but after each long, bright muzzle flash, there was no thumping impact of bullet into flesh, and the runner was swallowed up by darkness. Lothar slid the weapon back into his holster and fought to fill his lungs. His humiliation was more painful than his injury. Lothar was unaccustomed to failure. He forced himself to get to his feet. None of his men should see him grovelling, and after only a minute, and even though his lungs were still on fire, he went back and dragged his two captives to their feet with unnecessary violence. The woman was stark naked. Obviously she had been entertaining a client in the back bedroom. But now she was wailing tragically. Shut your mouth, you black cow, he told her, and shoved her through the back door of the cottage. The kitchen had been used as the bar. There were cases of liquor stacked to the ceiling, and the table was piled with a high pyramid of empty tumblers. In the front room, the floor was covered with broken glass and spilled liquor, evidence of the haste with which it had been vacated, and Lothar wondered how so many customers had fitted into a room that size. He had seen at least twenty escape into the night. He shoved the naked prostitute towards one of his black constables. Take care of her, he ordered, and the man grinned lasciviously and tweaked one of her tawny, melon round breasts. And none of that, Lothar warned him. He was still angry at the one who had got away, and the constable saw his face and sobered. He led the woman through into the bedroom to find her clothing. Lothar's other men were coming in, each of them leading two or three sorry-looking captives. Check their passes, Lothar ordered and turned to his sergeant. All right, Cronier, let's get rid of this stuff. Lothar watched as the cases of liquor were carried out and stacked in front of the cottage. Two of his constables opened them and smashed the bottles against the edge of the curb. The sweet, fruity smell of cheap brandy filled the night, and the gutter ran with the amber-brown liquor. When the last bottle had been destroyed, Lothar nodded at his sergeant. OK, Cronier, take them up to the station. And while the prisoners were loaded into the two police trucks that had followed his Land Rover, Lothar went back into the cottage to check that his men had not overlooked anything of importance. In the back room, with its tumbled bed and stained sheets, he opened the single cupboard and distastefully used the point of his riot baton to rummage through it. Beneath the pile of clothing, at the bottom of the cupboard, was a small cardboard carton. Lothar pulled it out and tore open the lid. It was filled with a neat stack of single-leaf pamphlets, and idly he glanced at the top one until its impact struck him. He snatched up the sheet and turned it to the light from the bare bulb in the ceiling. This is the poko, of which it is said, Take up your spear in your right hand, my beloved people, for the foreigners are looting your land. Poko was the military branch of the Pan-Africanist Congress. The word poko meant pure and untainted, for none other than pure-blooded African Bantu could become members and Lothar knew it for an organisation of young fanatics already responsible for a number of vicious and brutal murders. In the little town of Pal in the Cape, Porco had marched hundreds strong upon the police station, and when driven back had vented their fury upon the civilian population, massacring two white women, one a girl of 17 years. In the Transkai, they had attacked a road party encampment and murdered the white supervisor and his family in the most atrocious manner. Lothar had seen the police photographs, and his skin crawled at the memory. Polko was a name to fear, and Lothar read the rest of the pamphlet with full attention. It said, On Monday we are going to face the police. All the people of Sharpville will be as one on that day. No man or woman will go to his place of work. No man or woman will leave the township by bus or train or taxi. 
All the people will gather as one and march to the police station. We are going to protest at the past law, which is a terrible burden, too heavy for us to carry. We will make the white police fear us. Any man or woman who does not march with us on Monday will be hunted down. On that day, all the people will be as one. Poco has said this thing. Hear it and obey it. Lothar read the crudely printed pamphlet through again, and then he murmured, So it has come at last. He picked out the sentence which had offended him most. We will make the white police fear us. And he read it aloud. So? <laughs> well, we'll see about that. And he shouted for his sergeant to take the carton of subversive leaflets out to the truck. There was an inevitability in Raleigh Tabaka's life. The great river of his existence carried him along with it so that he was powerless to break free of it or even swim against the current. His mother, as one of the most adept of the tribal Sangomas of the Tosa, had first instilled in him the deep awareness of his African self. She had showed him the mysteries and the secrets and read the future for him in the casting of the bones. One day you will lead your people, Raleigh Tabaka she prophesied. You will become one of the great chiefs of Koza, and your name will be spoken with those of Makana and Ndlama. All these things I see in the bones. When his father, Hendrik Tabaka, sent him and his twin brother Wellington across the border to the multiracial school in Swaziland, his Africanism had been confirmed and underscored, for his fellow pupils had been the sons of chiefs and black leaders from countries like Basutuland and Bechuanland. These were countries where black tribes ruled themselves, free of the white man's heavy paternal influences, and he listened with awe as they spoke of how their families lived on equal terms with the whites around them. This came as a total revelation to Raleigh. In his existence, the whites were a breed apart, to be feared and avoided, for they wielded an unchallenged power over him and all his people. At Waterford he learned that this was not the law of the universe. There were white pupils, and although it was at first strange, he ate at the same table as they did, from the same plates and with the same utensils, and slept in a bed alongside them in the school dormitory, and sat on the toilet seat, still warm, from a white boy's bottom, and vacated it to another little white boy waiting impatiently outside the door for him to finish. In his own country none of these things were allowed, and when he went home for the holidays he read the notices with his eyes wide open. The notices that said, Whites only, Blunkers alienluck. From the windows of the train he saw the beautiful farms and the fat cattle that the white men owned, and the bare, eroded earth of the tribal reservations. And when he reached home at Drake's farm he saw that his father's house, which he remembered as a palace, was in reality a hovel and the resentment began to gnaw at his soul, and the wounds it left festered. Before Raleigh left to go to school, his uncle Moses Gama used to visit his father. From infancy he had been in awe of his uncle, for power burned from him like one of those great felt fires which consumed the land and towered into the heavens in a column of dense smoke and ash and sparks. Even though Moses Gama had been absent from Drake's farm for so many years, his memory had never been allowed to grow dim, and Hendrick had read aloud to the family the letters that he had received from him in distant lands. So when at last Raleigh matriculated and left Waterford to return to Drake's farm and begin work in his father's businesses, he announced that he wanted to take his place in the ranks of the young warriors. After you have been to initiation camp, his father promised him, I will introduce you to Amkonte Wisizwe. Raleigh's initiation set the final stamp on his special sense of Africanism. With his brother Wellington and six other young men of his initiation class, he left Drake's farm and travelled by train in the bare third-class carriage to the little magisterial town of Queenstown, which was the centre of the Tosa tribal territories. It had all been arranged by his mother, and the elders of the tribe met them at Queenstown Station. 
In a rickety old truck, they were driven out to a kraal on the banks of the Great Fish River and delivered into the care of the tribal custodian, an old man whose duty it was to preserve and safeguard the history and customs of the tribe. Nglama, the old man, ordered them to strip off their clothing and to hand over all the possessions they had brought with them. These were thrown onto a bonfire on the river bank as a symbol of childhood left behind them. He took them naked into the river to bathe, and then, still glistening wet, he led them up the far bank to the circumcision hut where the tribal witch doctors waited. When the other initiates hung back fearfully, Raleigh went boldly to the head of the column and was the first to stoop through the low entrance to the hut. The interior was thick with smoke from the dung fire and the witch doctors, in their skins and feathers and fantastic headdresses, were weird and terrifying figures. Raleigh was smitten with terror. For the pain which he had dreaded all his childhood and for the forces of the supernatural which lurked in the gloomy recesses of the hut, yet he forced himself to run forward and leap over the smouldering fire. As he landed on the far side, the witch doctors sprang upon him and forced him into a kneeling position, holding his head so that he was forced to watch as one of them seized his penis and drew out the rubbery collar of his foreskin to its full length. In ancient times the circumciser would have used a hand-forged blade, but now it was a Gillette razor blade. As they intoned the invocation to the tribal gods, Raleigh's foreskin was cut away, leaving his glands soft and pink and vulnerable. His blood spattered onto the dung floor between his knees, but he uttered not a sound. Glamour helped him rise, and he staggered out into the sunlight and fell upon the river bank, riding the terrible burning pain. But the shrieks of the other boys and the sounds of their wild struggles carried clearly to where he lay. He recognised his brother Wellington's cries of pain as the shrillest and loudest of them all. Raleigh knew that their foreskins would be gathered up by the witch doctors, salted and dried, and added to the tribal totem. A part of them would remain forever with the custodians, and no matter how far they wandered, the witch doctors could call them back with the foreskin curse. When all the other initiates had suffered the circumciser's knife, Nglama led them down to the water's edge and showed them how to wash and bind their wounds with medicinal leaves and herbs and to strap their penis against their stomachs. For if their mamba looks down, it will bleed again, he warned them. They smeared their bodies with a mixture of clay and ash. Even the hair on their heads was crusted with the dead white ritual paint, so that they looked like albino ghosts. Their only clothing was skirts of grass, and they built their huts in the deepest and most secret parts of the forest, for no woman might look upon them. They prepared their own food, plain maize cakes without any relish, and meat was forbidden them during the three moons of their initiation. Their only possession was their food bowl of clay. One of the boys developed an infection of his circumcision wound. The stinking green pus ran from it like milk from a cow's teat, and the fever consumed him so his skin was almost painfully hot to the touch. The herbs and potions that Nglamour applied were of no avail. He died on the fourth day, and they buried him in the forest, and Ndlama took his food bowl away. It would be thrown through the front door of his mother's hut by one of the witch doctors, without a word being spoken, and she would know that her son had not been acceptable to the tribal gods. Each day from before dawn's light until after sunset, Ndlama gave them instructions and taught them their duties as members of the tribe, as husbands and as fathers. They learned to endure pain and hardship with stoicism. They learned discipline and duty to their tribe, the ways of the wild animals and plants, how to survive in the wilderness, and how to please their wives and raise their children. When the wounds of the circumcision blade had healed, Nglama bound up their members each night in the special knot called the Red Dog, to prevent them spilling their seed in the sacred initiation huts. Each morning, Ndlama inspected the knots carefully to ensure that they had not been loosened to enjoy the forbidden pleasure of masturbation. When the three moons had passed, Ndlama led them back to the river 
and they washed away the white initiation clay and anointed their bodies with a mixture of fat and red ochre. And Indlama gave them each a red blanket, symbol of manhood, with which they covered themselves. In procession, singing the manhood songs which they had practised, they went to where the tribe waited at the edge of the forest. Their parents had gifts for them, clothing and new shoes and money, and the girls giggled and ogled them boldly. For they were men now, and able at last to take a wife, as many wives as they could afford, for the labola, the marriage fee, was heavy. The two brothers, accompanied by their mother, journeyed back to Drake's farm, Wellington to take leave of their father, for he was going on to take holy orders, and Raleigh to remain at his father's side to learn the multifarious facets of Hendrik Tabucca's business activities, and eventually to take the helm and become the comfort and mainstay of Hendrik's old age. These were fascinating and disturbing months and years for Raleigh. Until this time he had never guessed at his father's wealth and power, but gradually it was revealed to him. The pages in the ledger turned for him one at a time. He learned of his father's general dealer stores, and the butcheries and bakeries in all the black townships spread throughout the great industrial triangle of the Transvaal that was based on the gold mines and the iron deposits and the coal fields. Then he went on to learn about the cattle herds and rural general dealer's stores in the tribal reservations, owned by his father and cared for by his myriad brothers, about the shabines and the whores that operated behind the front of legitimate business, and finally he learned about the buffaloes, that ubiquitous and shadowy association of many men from all the various tribes whose chief was his own father. He realised at last just how rich and powerful his father was, and yet how, because he was a black man, he could not display his importance and could wield his power only covertly and clandestinely. Raleigh felt his anger stir, as it did whenever he saw those signs, whites only, blancas alienluk, and saw the white men pass in their shiny automobiles, or when he stood outside the universities and hospitals which were closed to him. He spoke to his father about these things that troubled him, and Hendrik Tabaka chuckled and shook his head. Rage makes a man sick, my son. It spoils his appetite for life and keeps him from sleep at night. We cannot change our world, so we must look for the good things in life and enjoy those to the full. The white man is strong. You cannot imagine how strong. You have not seen even the strength of his little finger. If you take up the spear against him, he will destroy you and all the things we have. And if the gods and the lightnings intervened and by chance you destroyed the white man, think what would follow him. There would come a darkness and a time without law and protection that would be a hundred times worse than the white man's oppressions. We would be consumed by the rage of our own people, and we would not have even the consolation of these few sweet things. If you open your ears and your eyes, my son, you will hear how the young people call us collaborators and how they talk of a redistribution of wealth, and you will see the envy in their eyes. The dream you have, my son, is a dangerous dream. And yet I must dream it, my father, said Raleigh. And then one unforgettable day, his uncle, Moses Gama, returned from foreign lands and took him to meet other young men who shared the same dream. So during the day, Raleigh worked at his father's business, and in the evenings he met with the other young comrades of Amkonta Wesizwe. At first they only talked, but the words were sweeter and headier than the smoke of the dacha pipes of the old men. Then Raleigh joined the comrades who were enforcing the decrees of the African National Congress, the boycotts and the strikes and the work stoppages. He went to Everton location with a small task force to enforce the bus boycott, and they attacked the black workers in the bus queues, who were trying to get to their places of employment, or who were going to shop for their families. And they beat them with shamboks, the long leather quirts, and with their fighting sticks. On the first day of the attacks, Raleigh was determined to demonstrate his zeal to his comrades, and he used his fighting stick with all the skill which he had learned as a child in faction fights with the boys of the other tribes. There was a woman in the queue for the bus who defied Raleigh's order to go home and she spat at him and his comrades and called them tzotzis and skellums, gangsters and rogues. 
She was a woman in middle age, large and matronly, with cheeks so plump and shiny that they looked as though they had been rubbed up with black shoe polish, and with such a queenly manner that at first the young comrades of Amconte um, Wissiswa were abashed by her scorn and might have withdrawn. Then Raleigh saw that this was his opportunity to prove his ardour, and he leapt forward and confronted the woman. Go home, old woman, he warned her. We are no longer dogs to eat the white man's shit. You are a little uncircumcised boy with filth on your tongue, she began. But Raleigh would not let her continue. He swung the long, supple fighting stick, and it split her shiny black cheek as cleanly as the cut of an axe. So for an instant Raleigh saw the bone gleam in the depths of the wound before the swift crimson flood obscured it. The big woman screamed and fell to her knees. And Raleigh felt a strange sensation of power and purpose, a euphoria of patriotic duty. For a moment the woman kneeling before him became the focus of all his frustration and his rage. The woman saw it in his eyes and held up both arms over her head to ward off the next blow. Raleigh struck again with all his strength and skill, using his wrist so that the fighting stick whined in the air and the blow landed on the woman's elbow. Her arms were wreathed in layers of deep fat. It hung in dewlaps from her upper arms and in bracelets about her wrists, but it could not cushion the power behind that whistling stick. The joint of her elbow shattered and her forearm dropped and twisted at an impossible angle as it hung helplessly at her side. The woman screamed again. This time the sound was so filled with outrage and agony that it goaded the other young warriors, and they fell upon the bus passengers with such fury that the terminus was strewn with the wailing and sobbing injured, and the concrete floor was washed with sticky red. When the ambulances came with sirens wailing to collect the casualties, the comrades of Amconte Wessis were pelted them with stones and half bricks, and Raleigh led a small group of the bolder ones who ran out into the street and turned one of the stranded ambulances on its side. And when the petrol poured from the tank, Raleigh lit a match and tossed it on the spread pool. The explosive ignition singed his eyelashes and burned away the front of his hair. But that evening, when they got back to Drake's farm, Raleigh was the hero of the band of warriors, and they gave him the praise name of Chisa which means the burner. As Raleigh was accepted into the middle ranks of the Youth League of the ANC and Amkonta with Sizua, so he gradually understood the cross-currents of power within them and the internal politics of the rival groups of moderates and radicals, those who thought that freedom could be negotiated and those who believed that it must be won with the blade of the spear, those who thought that the treasures so patiently built up over the years, the mines and the factories and the railways, should be preserved, and those who believed that it should all be destroyed and rebuilt again in the name of freedom by the pure ones. Raleigh found himself inclining more and more towards the purists, the hard-fighting men, the exclusive Bantu elite, and when he heard the name Poko for the first time, he thrilled to the sound and sense of it. It described exactly his own feelings and desires, the pure, the only ones. He was present in the house in Drake's farm when Moses Gama spoke to them and promised them that the long wait was almost at an end. I will take this land by its heels and set it upon its head, Moses Gama told the group of intense, loyal young warriors. I will give you a deed, a sign that every man and woman will understand instantly. It will bring the tribes into the streets in their millions, and their rage will be a beautiful thing so pure and strong that nobody, not even the hard boars, will be able to resist. Soon Raleigh came to sense in Moses Gama a divinity that set him above all other humans, and he was filled with a religious love for him and a deep and utter commitment. 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 When the news reached Raleigh that Moses Gama had been caught by the white police, as he was on the point of blowing up the Houses of Parliament and destroying all the evil contained in that iniquitous institution, Raleigh was almost prostrated by his grief and yet set on fire by Moses Garma's courage and example. Over the weeks and months that followed, Raleigh was exasperated and angered by the calls for moderation from the high councils of the ANC, 
and by the dispirited and meek acceptance of Moses Garma's imprisonment and trial. He wanted to vent his wrath upon the world, and when the Pan-Africanist Congress broke away from the ANC, Rally followed where his heart led. Robert Sabukwe, the leader of the Pan-Africanist Congress, sent for him. I have heard good words of you, he told Rally, and I know the man who is your uncle, the father of us all who languishes in the white man's prison. It is our duty, for we are the pure ones, to bring our message to every black man in the land. There is much work to do, and this is the task I have set for you alone, Rally Tabaka. He led Raleigh to a large-scale map of the Transvaal. This area has been left untouched by the ANC. He placed his hand over the sweep of townships and coal fields and industry around the town of Vereniging. This is where I want you to begin their work. Within a week, Raleigh had conditioned his father to the idea that he should move to the Vereniging area to take charge of the family interests there, the three stores in Everton and the butchery and bakery in Sharpville. And his father liked the idea the more he thought about it, and he agreed. I will give you the names of the men who command the buffaloes down there. We can begin moving the Shabins into the Sharpville area. So far we have not put our cattle to graze on those pastures, and the grass there is tall and green. Raleigh moved slowly at first. He was a stranger in Sharpville, and he had to consolidate his position. However, he was a strong and comely young man, and he spoke fluently all the major languages of the townships. This was not an unusual achievement. There were many who spoke all the four related languages of the Nguni group of peoples, the Zulus, the Kozas, the Swazi and the Indibeli, which make up almost 70% of the black tribes of South Africa, and whose speech is characterised by elaborate clicking and clucking sounds. Many others, like Raleigh, were also conversant with the other two languages which was spoken by almost the entire remainder of the black population, the Sutu and the Tswana. Language was no barrier, and Raleigh had the additional advantage of being placed in charge of his father's business interest in the area, and therefore was accorded almost immediate recognition and respect. Sooner or later, every single resident of Sharpville would come to either Tabaka's bakery or butcher shop and be impressed by the articulate and sympathetic young man who listened to their worries and troubles and extended them credit to buy the white bread and fizzy drinks and tobacco. These were the staple diet of the townships, where much of the old way of life was abandoned and forgotten, where the soured milk and maize meal were difficult to procure and where rickets made the children lethargic, bent their bones and turned their hair fine and wispy and dyed a peculiar bronze colour. They told Raleigh their little troubles, like the cost of renting the township houses and the hardship of commuting such distances to their place of work that it was necessary to rise long before the sun. And then they told Raleigh their greater worries, of being evicted from their homes and of the harassment by the police who were always raiding for liquor and pass offences and prostitution and to enforce the influx control laws. But always it came down to the passes the little booklets that ruled their lives. The police always were there to ask, Where is your pass? Show me your pass book. The Dompas, they called it. The damned pass. In which were stamped all their details of birth and residence and right to reside. No black person could get a job unless he or she produced the damned pass book. From all the people who came to the shops, Raleigh chose the young vital ones, the brave ones with rage in their hearts, and they met discreetly at first in the storeroom at the back of the bakery, sitting on the bread baskets and the piles of flour bags, talking the night through. Then they moved more openly, speaking to the older people and the children in the schools, going about as disciples to teach and explain. Raleigh used the funds of the butchery to buy a second-hand duplicator, and he typed the pamphlets on the pink wax sheets and ran them off on the machine. They were crude little pamphlets, with botchy typing errors and obvious corrections, and each one began with the salutation. This is Pokwa, of which it is said, and always ended with the stern injunction, Pokwa has said this thing, hear it and obey it. 
the young men, whom Raleigh had recruited, distributed these and read them to those who could not read for themselves. At first, Raleigh allowed only men to come to the meetings in the back room of the bakery store, for they were purists, and it was the traditional role of the men to herd the cattle and hunt the game and defend the tribe, while the women thatched the huts and tilled the earth for maize and sorghum and carried the children on their backs. Then the word passed down from the high command of Poco and PAC that the women were also part of the struggle. So Raleigh spoke with his young men, and one evening a girl came to their Friday night meeting in the bakery storeroom. She was a Torza, and she was tall and strong, with beautiful swelling buttocks, and the round sweet face like one of the wild felt flowers. While Raleigh spoke, she listened silently. She did not move or fidget or interrupt, and her huge dark eyes never left Raleigh's face. Raleigh felt that he was inspired that night, and though he never looked directly at the girl and seemed to address himself to the young warriors, it was to her he spoke, and his voice was deep and sure, and his own words reverberated in his skull, and he listened to them with the same wonder as the others did. When he had finished speaking at last, they all sat in silence for a long time, and then one of the young men turned to the girl and said, Amelia, that was the first time ever that Raleigh heard her name, Amelia, will you sing for us? She did not simper or hang her head or make modest protestations. She simply opened her mouth and sound poured out of her, glorious sound that made the skin on Raleigh's forearms and at the back of his neck tingle. He watched her mouth while she sang. Her lips were soft and broad, shaped like two leaves of the wild peach tree with a dark iridescence that shaded to soft pink on the inside of her mouth. And when she reached for an impossibly sweet high note, he saw that her teeth were perfect white as bone that had lain for a season in the felt, polished by the wind and bleached by the African sun. The words of the song were strange to him, but like the voice that sang them, they thrilled Rally. When the role of heroes is called, will my name be on it? I dream of that day when I will sit with Moses Gama and we will talk of the passing of the Boers. She went away with the young men who had brought her, and that night Raleigh dreamed of her. She stood beside the pool in the Great Fish River, in which he had washed away the white clay paint of his childhood, and she wore the short beaded kilt, and her breasts and her legs were bare. Her legs were long, and her breasts were round and hard as black marble, and she smiled at him with those even white teeth. And when Raleigh awoke, his seed was splashed upon the blanket which covered him. Three days later she came to the bakery to buy bread, and Raleigh saw her through the peephole above his desk, through which he could watch all that was happening in the front of the store, and he went through to the counter and greeted her gravely. "'I see you, Amelia,' she smiled at him and replied. "'I see you also, Raleigh Tabaka.' And it seemed that she sang his name, for she gave it a music that he had never heard in it before. She purchased two loaves of white bread, but Raleigh lingered over the sale, wrapping each loaf carefully and counting the pennies of her change as though they were gold sovereigns. What is your full name? he asked her. I am called Amelia Sigella. Where is your father's kraal, Amelia Sigella? My father is dead, and I live with my father's sister. She was a teacher at the Sharpville Primary School, and she was twenty years old. When she left with her bread wrapped in newspaper and her buttocks swinging and jostling each other beneath the yellow European-style skirt, Raleigh returned to his desk in the cubicle of his office and sat for a long time staring at the wall. On Friday, Amelia Sigella came again to the meeting in the back room of the bakery, and at the end she sang for them once again. This time Raleigh knew the words, and he sang with her. He had a good deep baritone, but she gilded it and wreathed it in the glory of her startling soprano, and when the meeting broke up, Raleigh walked back with her through the dark streets to her aunt's house in the avenue beyond the school. They lingered at the door, and he touched her arm. It was warm and silky beneath his fingers. On the Sunday, when he took the train back to Drake's farm to make his weekly report to his father, 
He told his mother about Amelia Sigella, and the two of them went through to the sacred room where his mother kept the family gods. His mother sacrificed a black chicken and spoke to the carved idols, particularly to the totem of Raleigh's maternal great-grandfather, and he replied in a voice that only Raleigh's mother could hear. She listened gravely, nodding at what he said, and later, while they ate the sacrificial chicken with rice and herbs, she promised, I will speak to your father on your behalf. The following Friday, after the meeting, Raleigh walked home with Amelia again, but this time, as they passed the school where she taught, he drew her into the shadow of the buildings, and they stood against the wall very close together. She made no attempt to pull away when he stroked her cheek. So he told her, My father is sending an emissary to your aunt to agree a marriage price. Amelia was silent, and he went on. However, I will ask him not to do so if you do not wish it. I wish it very much, she whispered. And slowly and voluptuously, she rubbed herself against him like a cat. The labola, the marriage price, was twenty head of cattle worth a great deal of money, and Hendrik Tabaka told his son, you must work for it, just like other young men are forced to do. It would take Raleigh three years to accumulate enough to buy the cattle, but when he told Amelia, she smiled and told him, each day will make me want you more. Think then how great will be my want after three years, and think how sweet will be that moment when the wanting is assuaged. Every afternoon when school was out, Amelia came to the bakery, and quite naturally she took to working behind the counter, selling the bread and the round brown buns. Then when Raleigh closed the shop, she cooked his evening meal for him, and when he had eaten, they walked back to her aunt's house together. Amelia slept in a tiny room hardly bigger than a closet, across the passage from her aunt. They left the interleading doors open, and Raleigh lay on Amelia's bed with her, and under the blanket they played the sweet games that custom and tribal law sanctioned all engaged couples to play. Raleigh was allowed to explore delicately and with his fingertips, hunt for the little pink bud of flesh hidden between soft furry lips that old Ndlama had told him about at initiation camp. The Koza girls are not circumcised like the women of some of the other tribes, but they are taught the arts of pleasing men, and when he could stand it no longer, she took him and held him between her crossed thighs, avoiding only the final penetration that was reserved by tribal law for their wedding night. And skilfully she milked him of his seed. Strangely, it seemed that every time she did this, rather than depleting him, she replenished the well of his love for her until it was overflowing. Then the time came when Raleigh judged it expedient to begin infiltrating the buffaloes into the township. With Hendrik Tabaka's blessing and under Raleigh's supervision, they opened their first shabin in a cottage at the far end of the township, hard up against the boundary fence. The shabin was run by two of the buffaloes from Drake's farm, who had done this type of work for Hendrik Tabaka before. They knew all the little tricks, like adulterating the liquor to make it go further, and having one or two girls in the back room for the men that liquor had made amorous. However, Raleigh warned them about the local police force, who had an ugly reputation, and about one of the white officers in particular, a man with pale predatory eyes that had given him his nickname Ngwe, the leopard. He was a hard, cruel man who had shot to death four men in the time he had been in Sharpville, two of them members of the Buffaloes, who had been supplying the township with Dacha. At first they were cautious and wary, vetting their customers carefully and placing lookouts on all approaches to the Shabin. But then, as the weeks passed, with business improving each night, they relaxed a little. There was very little competition. Other Shabins had been closed down swiftly, and the customers were so thirsty that the buffaloes could charge three and four times the usual rate. Raleigh brought the liquor stocks into the township in his little blue Ford pickup, the crates hidden behind sacks of flour and sheep carcasses. He spent as little time as possible at the Shabin, for every minute was dangerous. He would drop off the supplies, collect the empty bottles and the cash, 
and be gone within a half an hour. He never drove the pickup directly to the front door of the cottage, but parked it in the dark felt beyond the boundary fence, and the two buffaloes would come through the hole in the wire mesh and help him carry the crates of cheap brandy. After a while, Raleigh realised that the Shabeen offered another good distribution point for the Pokor pamphlets that he printed on the duplicator. He usually kept a stock of these in the cottage, and the two buffaloes who ran the Shabeen and the girls who worked in the back room had orders to give one to each of their customers. In early March, not long after the glad tidings of Moses Garma's reprieve and the mitigation of his death sentence to life imprisonment, Sabukwe sent for rally. The rendezvous was in a house in the vast black township of Soweto. It was not one of the box-like flat-roofed cottages, but was rather a large modern bungalow situated in the elite section of the township known as Beverly Hills. It had a tiled roof, its own swimming pool, garaging for two vehicles and large plate-glass windows overlooking the pool. When Raleigh arrived in the blue pickup, he found that he was not the only invited guest, and there were a dozen or so other vehicles parked along the curb. Sabukwe had invited all his middle-ranking field officers to his briefing, and over forty of them crowded into the sitting room of the bungalow. Comrades, Sabukwe addressed them, we are ready to flex our muscles. You are working hard, and it is time to gather in some of the fruits of your labours. In all of the places where the Pan-Africanist Congress is strong, not only here on the Witwatersrand, but across the country, we are going to make the white police fear our power. We are going to hold a mass protest demonstration against the pass laws. Listening to Sabukwe speak, Raleigh was reminded of the power and personality of his own imprisoned uncle, Moses Gama, and he was proud to be part of this magnificent company. As Sabukwe unfolded his plans, Raleigh made a silent but fervent resolution that at Sharpville, the area for which he was responsible, the demonstration would be impressive and solid. He related every detail of the meeting and every word that Sabukwe had spoken to Amelia. Her lovely round face seemed to glow with excitement as she listened, and she helped him print the sheets announcing the demonstration and to pack them into the old liquor cartons in lots of 500. On the Friday before the planned demonstration, Raleigh ran a shipment of liquor down to the buffalo's shabines, and he took a carton of pamphlets with him. The buffaloes were waiting for him in the darkness beside the track, and one of them flashed a torch to guide the pickup into the scraggy patch of black wattle, and they unloaded the liquor and trudged across to the township fence. In the cottage, Raleigh counted the empty bottles and the full ones and checked these figures against the cash in the canvas bank bag. It tallied, and he gave a brief word of commendation to the two buffaloes and looked into the front room, which was packed with cheerful, noisy drinkers. Then, when the door to the nearest bedroom opened and a big Basutu ironworker came out, grinning and buttoning the front of his blue overalls, Raleigh squeezed past him into the back room. The girl was straightening the sheets on the bed. She was bending over with her back to Raleigh, and she was naked. But she looked over her shoulder and smiled when she recognised him. Raleigh was popular with all the girls. She had the money ready for him, and Raleigh counted it in front of her. There was no means of checking her, but over the years Hendrik Tabaka had developed an instinct for a cheating girl, and when Raleigh delivered the money to him, he would know if she was holding out. Raleigh gave her a box of pamphlets, and she sat beside him on the bed while he read one of them to her. I will be there on Monday, she promised, and I will tell all my men these things and give them each a paper. She placed the box in the bottom of the cupboard, and then came back to Raleigh and took his hand. Stay a little while, she invited him. I will straighten your back for you. She was a pretty, plump little thing, and Raleigh was tempted. Amelia was a traditional Nguni maiden, and she did not suffer the curse of Western-style jealousy. In fact, she had urged him to accept the offers of the other girls. If I am not allowed to sharpen your spear, let the joy girls keep it bright for the time when I am at last allowed to feel its kiss. Come, the girl urged Raleigh now, 
and stroked him through the cloth of his trousers. See how the cobra awakes, she laughed. Let me wring his neck. Rally took one step back towards the bed, laughing with her. Then suddenly he froze and the laugh was cut off abruptly. Out in the darkness, he had heard the whistle of the lookouts. Police, he snapped, the leopard. And there was the sudden distinctive rumble of a Land Rover being driven hard and headlights flashed across the cheap curtaining that covered the window. Raleigh sprang to the door. In the front room, the drinkers were fighting to escape through the door and windows and the table, covered with glasses and empty bottles, was overturned and glass shattered. Raleigh shouldered panic-stricken bodies out of his way and reached the kitchen door. It was locked, but he opened it with his own key and slipped through, locking it again behind him. He switched off the lights and stole across to the back door and placed his hand on the doorknob. He would not make the mistake of running out into the yard. The leopard was notoriously quick with his pistol. Raleigh waited in the darkness and he heard the screams and the scuffling, the crack of the riot batons on flesh and bone and the grunting of the men who swung them and he steeled himself. Just beyond the door, he heard light running footsteps, and suddenly the door handle was seized from the far side and violently twisted. As the man on the outside tried to pull the door open, Raleigh held it, and the other man heaved and swore, leaning back on it with all his weight. Raleigh let the handle go and reversed his resistance, throwing his body against the cheap pine door so that it burst open. He felt it crash into human flesh, and he had a glimpse of the brown uniformed figure hurtling backwards down the stairs. Then he used his own momentum to leap up and outwards, clearing the police officer like a steeplechaser, and he went bounding away towards the hole in the fence. As he ducked through it, he glanced back and saw the police officer on his knees. Though his features were contracted and swollen with pain and anger, Raleigh recognised him. It was Ngwe, the killer of men and the blue service revolver glinted in his hand as it cleared the holster at his side. Fear sped Raleigh's feet as he darted away into the darkness, but he jinked and twisted as he ran. Something passed close to his head with a snapping report that hurt his eardrums and made him flinch his head wildly, and he jinked again. Behind him was another thudding report, but he did not hear the second bullet, and he saw the dark shape of the Ford ahead of him. He tumbled into the front seat and started the engine. Without switching on the headlights, he bumped over the verge onto the track and accelerated away into the darkness. He found that he still had the canvas bag of money clutched in his left hand, and his relief was intense. His father would be incensed at the loss of the liquor stocks, but his anger would have been multiplied many times if Raleigh had lost the money as well. Solomon Nduli telephoned Michael Courtney at his desk in the newsroom. I have something for you, he told Michael. Can you come out to the Asagai offices right away? It's after five already, Michael protested, and it's Friday night. I won't be able to get a pass to enter the township. Come, Solomon insisted. I will wait for you at the main gate. He was as good as his promise. A tall, gangly figure in steel-rimmed glasses, waiting under the street lamp near the main gates, and as soon as he slipped into the front seat of the company car, Michael passed him his cigarette pack. Light one for me as well, he told Solomon. I brought some sardine and onion sandwiches and a couple of bottles of beer. They're on the back seat. There was no public place in Johannesburg, or in the entire land for that matter, where two men of different colour could sit and drink or eat together. Michael drove slowly and aimlessly through the streets, while they ate and talked. The PAC are planning their first big act since they broke away from the ANC, Solomon told Michael through a mouthful of sardine and onion. In some areas they have built up a strong support. In the Cape and the rural tribal areas, even in some parts of the Transvaal, they have pulled in all of the young militants who are unhappy with the pacifism of the old men. They want to follow... Moses Gamma's example, and take on the nationalists in a head-on fight. That's crazy, Michael said. 
You can't fight Sten guns and Saracen armoured cars with half bricks. Yes, it's crazy, but then some of the young people would prefer to die on their feet than live on their knees. They were together for an hour, talking all that time, and then at last Michael drove him back to the main gates of Drake's farm. So that's it then, my friend, Solomon opened the car door. If you want the best story on Monday, I would suggest you go down to the Vereniging area. The PAC and Poco have made that their stronghold on the Vidvatersrand. Everton? Michael asked. Yes, Everton will be one of the places to watch, Solomon duly agreed. But the PAC now have a new man in Sharpville. Sharpville? Michael asked. Where is that? I've never heard of it. Uh, only twelve miles from Everton. I'll find it on my road map. You might think it worth the trouble to go there, Solomon encouraged Michael. This PAC organiser in Sharpville is one of the party's young lions. He will put on a good show, you can count on that. Manfred de la Rey asked quietly, So, uh, how many reinforcements can we spare for the stations in the Val area? General Darnie LaRue shook his head and smoothed back the wings of silver hair at his temples with both hands. We have only three days to move in reinforcements from the outlying areas, and most of those will be needed in the Cape. It will mean stripping the outlying stations and leaving them very vulnerable. How many? Manfred insisted. Five or six hundred men for the vow, Danny LaRue said with obvious reluctance. That will not be enough, Manfred growled. So we will reinforce all stations lightly, but hold most of our forces in mobile reserve and react swiftly to the first hint of trouble. He turned his full attention to the map that covered the operations table in the control room of police headquarters in Marshall Square. Which are the main danger centres on the Val? Everton, Darnie LaRue replied without hesitation. It's always one of the trouble spots, and then Funnabale Park. What about Sharpville? Manfred asked, and held up the crudely printed pamphlet that he had tightly rolled in his hand. What about this? The general did not reply immediately, but he pretended to study the operations map as he composed his reply. He was well aware that the subversive pamphlets had been discovered by Captain Lothar de la Rey, and he knew how the minister felt about his son. Indeed, Darnie LaRue shared the general high opinion of Lothar, so he did not want to belittle him in any way or to offend his minister. There uh, may well be disturbances in the Sharpville area, he conceded, but it is a small township and has always been very peaceful. We can expect our men there to behave well, and I do not see any immediate danger. I suggest we send 20 or 30 men to reinforce Sharpville and concentrate our main efforts on the larger townships with violent histories of boycotts and strikes. Very well. Manfred agreed at last, but I want you to maintain at least 40% of our reinforcements in the reserve so that they can be moved quickly to any area that flares up unexpectedly. What about arms? Darnie LaRue asked. I am about to authorize the issue of automatic weapons to all units. He turned the statement into a query, and Manfred nodded. Yeah, we must be ready for the worst. There is a feeling amongst our enemies that we are on the verge of capitulation. Even our own people are becoming frightened and confused. His voice dropped, but his tone was fiercer and more determined. We have to change that. We have to crush these people who wish to tear down and destroy all we stand for and give this land over to bloodshed and anarchy. The centres of support for the PAC were widely scattered across the land, from the eastern tribal areas of the Siskai and the Transkai to the southern part of the Great Industrial Triangle along the Vaal River, and a thousand miles south of that in the black township of Langa and Nyanga that housed the greater part of the migrant worker force that serviced the mother city of Cape Town. In all these areas, Sunday the 20th of March 1960 was a day of feverish effort and planning, and of a peculiar expectancy. It was as though everybody at last believed that this new decade would be one of immense change. 
the radicals were filled with a feeling of infinite hope, however irrational, and with a certainty that the nationalist government was on the verge of collapse. They felt that the world was with them, that the age of colonialism had blown away on the winds of change, and that after a decade of massive political mobilisation by the black leaders, the time of liberation was at last at hand. All it needed now was one last shove, and the walls of apartheid would crash to earth, crushing under them the evil architect Favut and his builders who had raised them up. Raleigh Tabaka felt that marvellous euphoria as he and his men moved through the township, going from cottage to cottage with the same message. Tomorrow we will be as one people. No one will go to work. There will be no buses, and those who try to walk to the town will be met by the poco on the road. The names of all who defy the PAC will be taken and they will be punished. Tomorrow we are going to make the white police fear us. They worked all that day, and by evening every person, man and woman, in the township had been warned to stay away from work and to assemble in the open space near the new police station early on the Monday morning. We are going to make the white police fear us. We want everybody to be there. If you do not come, we will find you. Amelia had worked as hard and unremittingly as Raleigh had done. But like him, she was still fresh, unwearied and excited as they ate a quick and simple meal in the back room of the bakery. Tomorrow we will see the sun of freedom rise, Raleigh told her as he wiped his bowl with a crust of bread. But we cannot afford to sleep. There is still much work to be done tonight. Then he took her hand and told her, Our children will be born free, and we will live our life together like men, not like animals. And he led her out into the darkening township to continue the preparations for the great day that lay ahead. They met in groups on the street corners, all the eager young ones, and Raleigh and Amelia moved amongst them, delegating their duties for the tomorrow selecting those who would picket the road leading from Sharpville to Vorenichen. You will let no one pass. Nobody must leave the township, Raleigh told them. All of the people must be as one when we march on the police station tomorrow morning. You must tell the people not to fear, Raleigh urged them. Tell them that the white police cannot touch them and that there will be a most important speech from the white government concerning the abolition of the pass laws. Tell the people they must be joyful and unafraid and that they must sing the freedom songs that PAC has taught them. After midnight, Raleigh assembled his most loyal and reliable men, including the two buffaloes from the Shabin, and they went to the homes of all the black bus drivers and taxi drivers in the township and pulled them from their beds. Nobody will leave Sharpville tomorrow, they told them, but we do not trust you not to obey your white bosses. We will guard you until the march begins. Instead of driving your buses and taxis tomorrow and taking our people away, you will march with them to the police station. We will see to it that you do. Come with us now. As the false dawn flushed the eastern sky, Raleigh himself scaled a telephone pole at the boundary fence and cut the wires. When he slid down again, he laughed as he told Amelia, now our friend the leopard will not find it so easy to call in other police to help him. Captain Lothar de Larey parked his Land Rover and left it in a sanitary lane in a patch of shadow out of the street lights, and he moved quietly to the corner and stood alone. He listened to the night. In the years he had served at Sharpville, he had learned to judge the pulse and the mood of the township. He let his feelings and his instincts take over from reason, and almost immediately he was aware of the feral excitement and sense of expectation which had the township in its grip. It was quiet until you listened, as Lothar was listening now. He heard the dogs. They were restless, some close, others at a distance, yapping and barking, and there was an urgency in them. They were seeing and scenting groups and single figures in the shadows, men hurrying on secret errands. Then he heard the other sounds, soft as insect sounds in the night, the whistle of lookouts on the watch for his patrols and the recognition signals of the street gangs. In one of the dark cottages nearby, a man coughed nervously, unable to sleep, and in another, 
A child whimpered fretfully and was instantly hushed by a woman's soft voice. Lothar moved quietly through the shadows, listening and watching. Even without the warning of the pamphlets, he would have known that tonight the township was awake and strung up. Lothar was not an imaginative or romantic young man, but as he scouted the dark streets, he suddenly had a clear mental picture of his ancestors performing the same dire task. He saw them bearded and dressed in drab homespun, armed with the long muzzle loaders, leaving the security of the lagered wagons, going out alone into the African night to scout for the enemy, the Swat Khafar, the Black Danger. Spying out the bivouac where the black impies lay upon their war shields, waiting for the dawn to rush in upon the wagons. His nerves crawled at those atavistic memories, and he seemed to hear the battle chant of the tribes in the night and the drumming of assegai on rawhide shield, the stamp of bare feet and the crash of war rattles on wrist and ankle as they came in upon the wagons for the dawn attack. In his imagination, the cry of the restless infant in the nearby cottage became the death screams of the little Boer children at Weenan, where the black impies had come sweeping down from the hills to massacre all in the Boer encampment. He shivered in the night as he realised that though so much had changed, as much had remained the same. The black danger was still there, growing each day stronger and more ominous. He had seen the confident, challenging look of the young blacks as they swaggered through the streets and heard the warlike names they had adopted, the spear of the nation and the pure ones. Tonight, more than ever, he was aware of the danger and he knew where his duty lay. He went back to the Land Rover and drove slowly through the streets. Time and again he glimpsed small groups of dark figures, but when he turned the spotlight upon them, they melted away into the night. Everywhere he went he heard the warning whistles out there in the darkness, and his nerves tightened and tingled. When he met his own foot-patrolling constables, they also were nervous and ill at ease. When the dawn turned, the eastern sky pale yellow and dimmed out the street lights, he drove back through the streets. At this time in the morning, they should have been filled with hurrying commuters, but now they were empty and silent. Lothar reached the bus terminus, and it too was almost deserted. Only a few young men in small groups lounged at the railings. There were no buses, and the pickets stared at the police Land Rover openly and insolently as Lothar drove slowly past. As he skirted the boundary fence, passing close to the main gates, he exclaimed suddenly and braked the Land Rover. From one of the telephone poles, the cables trailed limply to the earth. Lothar left the vehicle and went to examine the damage. He lifted the loose end of the dangling copper wire and saw immediately that it had been cut cleanly. He let it drop and walked slowly back to the Land Rover. Before he climbed into the driver's seat, he glanced at his wristwatch. It was ten minutes past five o'clock. Officially, he would be off duty at six, but he would not leave his post today. He knew his duty. He knew it would be a long and dangerous day, and he steeled himself to meet it. On Monday morning, the 21st of March, 1960, a thousand miles away in the Cape Townships of Langa and Inyanga, the crowds began assembling. It was raining. That cold, drizzling Cape Northwester blew from the sea, dampening the ardour of the majority. But by 6am, there was a crowd of almost 10,000 gathered outside the Langa bachelor quarters, ready to begin the march on the police station. The police anticipated them. During the weekend, they had been heavily reinforced, and all officers and senior warrant officers issued with Sten guns. Now a Saracen armoured car, in drab green battle paint, entered the head of the wide road in which the crowd had assembled, and a police officer addressed them over the loudspeaker system. He told them that all public meetings had been banned, and that a march on the police station would be treated as an attack. The black leaders came forward and negotiated with the police, and at last agreed to disperse the crowd, but warned that nobody would go to work that day and there would be another mass meeting at 6pm that evening. When the evening meeting began to assemble, 
the police arrived in Saracen armoured cars and ordered the crowd to disperse. When they stood their ground, the police baton charged them. The crowd retaliated by stoning the police and in a mass rushed forward to attack them. The police commander gave the command to fire and the Sten guns buzzed in automatic fire and the crowd fled, leaving two of their number dead upon the field. From then on, weeks of rioting and stoning and marches racked the Cape Peninsula, culminating in a massed march of tens of thousands of blacks. This time they reached the police headquarters at Caledon Square, but dispersed quietly after their leaders had been promised an interview with the Minister of Justice. When the leaders arrived for this interview, they were arrested on orders of Manfred de la Rey, the Minister of Police, and because police reserves had by this time been stretched almost to breaking point, Soldiers and sailors of the Defence Force were rushing in to supplement the local police units, and within three days the black townships were cordoned off securely. In the Cape, the struggle was over. In Van der Bale Park, ten miles from Vereniging and in Everton, both notorious centres of radical and violent black political resistance, the crowds began to gather at first light on Monday the 21st of March, 1960. By nine o'clock, the marchers, thousands strong, set out in procession for their local police stations. However, they did not get very far. Here, as in the Cape, the police had been reinforced, and the Saracen armoured cars met them on the road, and the loud hailers boomed out the orders to disperse. The orderly columns of marchers, bogged down in the quicksands of uncertainty and ineffectual leadership, and the police vehicles moved down on them ponderously, forcing them back, and finally broke up their formations with baton charges. Then abruptly the sky was filled with a terrible rushing sound, and every black face was turned upwards. A flight of Sabre jet fighter aircraft of the South African Air Force flashed overhead, only a hundred feet above the heads of the crowd. They had never seen modern jet fighters in such low-level flight, and the sight and the sound of the mighty engines was unnerving. The crowds began to break up, and their leaders lost heart. The demonstrations were over, almost before they had begun. Robert Sabuqui himself marched to Orlando Police Station in Great Soweto. It was five miles from his house in Mofolo, and although small groups of men joined him along the way, they were less than a hundred strong when they reached the police station and offered themselves for arrest under the pass laws. In most other centres there were no marches and no arrests. At Hercules Police Station in Pretoria, six men arrived passless and demanded to be arrested. A jocular police officer obligingly took their names and then sent them home. In most of the Transvaal, it was undramatic and anticlimactic. But then there was Sharpville. Rally Tabaka had not slept at all that night. He had not even lain down to rest, but had been on his feet exhorting and encouraging and organising. Now, at six o'clock in the morning, he was at the bus depot. The gates were still locked, and in the yard the long, ungainly vehicles stood in silent rows, while a group of three anxious-looking supervisors waited inside the gates for the drivers to arrive. The buses should have commenced their first run at 4.30 a.m., and by now there was no possibility that they could honour their schedules. From the direction of the township, a single figure jogged down the deserted road, and behind the depot gate the bus company supervisors brightened and moved forward to open the gate for him. The man hurrying towards them wore the brown, peaked driver's cap with the brass insignia of the bus company on the headband. Ha! Raleigh said grimly. We have missed one of them and he signalled his men to intercept the black-leg driver. The driver saw the young man ahead of him, and he stopped abruptly. Raleigh sauntered up to him, smiling, and asked, "'Where are you going, my uncle?' The man did not reply, but glanced around him nervously. "'You are not going to drive your bus, were you?' Raleigh insisted. "'You have heard the words of PAC, of which all men have taken heed, have you not?' "'I have children to feed.' the man muttered sullenly, and I have worked twenty-five years without missing a day. 
Raleigh shook his head sorrowfully. You are a fool, old man. I forgive you for that. You cannot be blamed for the worm in your skull that has devoured your brains, but you are also a traitor to your people. For this I cannot forgive you. And he nodded to his young men. They seized the driver and dragged him into the bushes beside the road. The driver fought back, but they were young and strong and many in number, and he went down screaming under the blows, and after a while, when he was quiet, they left him lying in the dusty, dry grass. Raleigh felt no pity or remorse as he walked away. The man was a traitor, and he should count himself fortunate if he survived his punishment to tell his children of his treachery. At the bus terminus, Raleigh's pickets assured him that only a few commuters had attempted to, to defy the boycott, but they had scurried away as soon as they had seen the waiting pickets. Besides, one of them told Raleigh, not a single bus has arrived. You have all begun this day well. Now let us move on to greet the sun of our freedom as it dawns. They gathered in the other pickets as they marched and Amelia was waiting with her children and the other school staff at the corner of the school yard. She saw Raleigh and ran laughing to join him. The children giggled and shrieked with excitement, delighted with this unexpected release from the drudgery of the schoolroom, and they skipped behind Raleigh and his young pickets as they went on. From each cottage they passed, the people swarmed out, and when they saw the laughing children they were infected by the gaiety and excitement. Amongst them, by now, there were grey heads and young mothers with their infants strapped to their backs, older women in aprons leading a child on each hand, and men in the overalls of the steel company, or the more formal attire of clerks and messengers and shop assistants, and the black petty civil servants who assisted in the administration of the apartheid laws. Soon the road behind Raleigh and his comrades was a river of humanity. As they approached the open common ground, they saw that there was already a huge concourse of people gathered there, and from every road leading on to the common, more came swarming each minute. Five thousand? Raleigh asked Amelia, and she squeezed his hand and danced with excitement. More, she said. There must be more. Ten thousand, even fifteen thousand. Oh, Raleigh, I'm so proud and happy. Look at our people. Isn't it a fine sight to see them all here? She turned and looked up at him adoringly. And I am so proud of you, Raleigh. Without you, these poor people would never have realized their misery, would never have the will to do anything to change their lot. But look at them now. As Raleigh moved forward, the people recognized him and made way for him, and they shouted his name and called him brother and comrade. At the end of the open common was a pile of old bricks and builder's rubble, and Raleigh made his way towards it. And when he reached it, he climbed up on top of it and raised his hands for silence. My people, I bring you the word of Robert Sabuqui, who is the father of PAC, and he charges you thus. Remember Moses Gama. Remember all the pain and hardships of your empty lives. Remember the poverty and the oppression. A roar went up from them and they raised their clenched fists or gave the thumbs-up sign, and they shouted, Amandla and Gama. It was some time before Raleigh could speak again, but he told them, We are going to burn our passes. He brandished his own booklet as he went on. We are going to make fires and burn the Dompass. Then we are going to march as one to the police station and ask them to arrest us. Then Robert Sabuque will come to speak for us. This was a momentary inspiration of Raleigh's, and he went on happily. Then the police will see that we are men, and they will fear us. Never again will they force us to show the Dompas. And we will be free men, as our ancestors were free men before the white man came to this land. He almost believed it as he said it. It all seemed so logical and simple. So they lit the fires dozens of them across the common, starting them with dry grass and crumpled sheets of newspaper, and then they clustered around them and threw their passbooks into the flames. The women began swaying their hips and shuffling their feet, and the men danced with them 
and the children scampered around between their legs, and they all sang the freedom songs. It was past eight o'clock before the marshals could get them moving, and then the mass of humanity began to uncoil like a huge serpent and crawl away towards the police station. Michael Courtney had watched the Everton demonstration fizzle out ignominiously, and from a public telephone booth he phoned the Vanderbilt Park police station to learn that after a police baton charge on the marchers, all was now quiet there also. When he tried to telephone the Sharpville police, he could not get through, although he wasted almost ten shillings in the coin slot and spent forty frustrating minutes in the telephone booth. In the end, he gave up in disgust and went back to the small Morris station wagon which Nana had given him for his last birthday present. He set off again towards Johannesburg, stealing himself for Leon Herbstein's sarcasm. So you got a fine story of the riot that didn't take place. Congratulations, Mickey. I knew I could rely on you. Michael grimaced and lit another cigarette to console himself. But as he reached the junction with the main road, he saw the sign, Virenachen, ten miles, and a smaller sign below it, Sharpville Township. And instead of turning towards Johannesburg, he turned south, and the Morris buzzed merrily down the strangely open and uncrowded roadway. Lothar de Lorraine kept a toilet kit in his desk, complete with razor and toothbrush. When he got back to the station, he washed and shaved in the hand basin in the men's toilet, and he felt refreshed. Although the sense of ominous disquiet that he had experienced during his night patrol still remained with him. The sergeant at the charge office saluted him as he entered. Uh, good morning, sir. Are you signing off duty? But Lothar shook his head. Has the commandant come on duty yet? Oh, he came in ten minutes ago. Have you had any telephone calls since midnight, sergeant? Now you come to mention it, sir. No, we haven't. That's funny, isn't it? Not so funny. The lines have been cut. You should have seen that in the station log, Lothar snapped at him and went through to the station commander's office. He listened gravely to Lothar's report. Yeah, Lothi, you did good work. I'm not happy about this business. I've had a bad feeling ever since you found those damn pamphlets. They should have given us more men here, not just twenty raw recruits. They should have given us experienced men instead of sending them to Everton and the other stations. I have called in the foot patrols, Lothar told him crisply. He did not want to listen to complaints about the decisions of his superiors. He knew there were good reasons for everything. I suggest we hold all our men here at the station. Concentrate our forces. Yeah, I agree, said the commander. Uh, what about weapons? Should I open the armory? Yeah, Lothi, I think you can go ahead. Uh, and I'd like to talk to the men before I go out on patrol again. All right, Lothi, you tell them we have everything in hand. They must just obey orders and it will be all right. Luther saluted and strode back into the charge office. Sergeant, I want an issue of arms to all white members. A sten guns? The man looked surprised. And four spare magazines per man? Lothar nodded. I will sign the order in the station log. The sergeant handed him the keys, and together they went through to the strong room, unlocked and swung open the heavy steel chub door. The sten guns stood in their racks against the side wall. Cheap little weapons of pressed steel manufacture. They looked like toys, but the nine-millimetre parabellum cartridges they fired would kill a man as efficiently as the finest crafted Purdy or square-bridged Mauser. The reinforcements were almost entirely from the police college. Fresh-faced and crew-cut, eager boys who looked up at the decorated captain with awe as he told them, uh, We're expecting trouble. That's why you are here. You have been issued stens. That alone is a responsibility that each of you must take seriously. Wait for orders. Do not act without them. But once you have them, respond swiftly. He took one of his constables with him and drove down to the main township gates with his sten gun on the seat beside him. It was well after six o'clock by then, but the streets were still quiet. He passed fewer than fifty people, all of them hurrying in the same direction. The post office repair truck was waiting at the gate, and Lothar escorted it down to where the telephone wires had been severed. He waited while a linesman scaled the pole and spliced the wires, and then he escorted the truck back to the gates. 
and before he reached the broad avenue that led up to the station gates, Lothar pulled to the side of the road and switched off the engine. The constable in the back seat shifted in his seat and began to say something, but Lothar snapped at him. Quiet! And the man froze. They sat in silence for several seconds before Lothar frowned. There was a sound like the sea heard from afar, a gentle susurration. And he opened the door of the Land Rover and stepped out. The whisper was like the wind in tall grass, and there was a faint vibration that he seemed to feel in the soles of his feet. Lothar jumped back into the Land Rover and drove swiftly to the next road junction and turned down it towards the open commonage and the school. The sound grew until he could hear it above the beat of the engine. He turned the next corner and tramped so hard on the brakes that the Land Rover shuddered and skidded to a halt. Ahead of him, from side to side, the road was blocked solid with humanity. They were shoulder to shoulder, rank upon rank, thousand upon thousands, and when they saw the police vehicle ahead of them, a great shout of Amandla went up, and they surged forward. For a moment, Lothar was paralysed by shock. He was not one of those unusual creatures who never felt fear. He had known fear intimately. On the clamorous field, when standing to meet the concerted rush of muscled bodies across the turf, as well as in the silent streets of the township, as he hunted dangerous, unscrupulous men in the night. He had conquered those fears and found a strange exhilaration in the feat. But this was a new thing. This was not human. This was a monster he faced now. A creature with 10,000 throats and 20,000 legs. A sprawling, insensate monster that roared a meaningless word and had no ears to hear nor mind to reason. It was the mob and Lothar was afraid. His instinct was to swing the Land Rover around and race back to the security of the station. In fact, he had already slammed the gear lever into reverse before he had control of himself. He left the engine running and opened the side door, and the constable in the back seat blasphemed, and his voice was thick with terror. Sodding Christ, let's get out of here! It served to steal Lothar and he felt contempt for his own weakness. As he had done so many times before, he strangled his fear and climbed onto the bonnet of the Land Rover. Deliberately, he had left the Sten gun on the front seat, and he did not even unbutton the holster on his belt. A single firearm was useless against this sprawling monster. 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 He held up his arms and shouted, Stop! You people must go back! That is a police order! But his words were drowned in the multitudinous voice of the monster, and it came on apace. The men in the front rank started to run towards him, and those behind shouted and pressed forward faster. Go back! Lothar roared. But there was not the slightest check in the ranks, and they were close now. He could see the expressions on the faces of the men in front, they were grinning. But Lothar knew how swiftly the African mood can change, how close below the smiles lies the violence of the African heart. He knew he could not stop them. They were too close, too excited, and he was aware that his presence had inflamed them. The mere sight of his uniform was enough. He jumped down and into the cab, reversed the Land Rover, and then accelerated forward, swinging the wheel into a full lock, and he pulled away as the leaders were within arm's reach. He pushed the accelerator flat against the floorboards. It was almost two miles back to the station. As he made a quick calculation on how long it would take the march to reach it, he was already rehearsing the orders he would give and working out additional precautions to secure the station. Suddenly there was another vehicle in the road ahead of him. He had not expected that, and as he swerved to avoid it, he saw it was a Morris with lacquered wooden struts supporting the station wagon body. The driver was a young white man. Lothar slowed and pulled his side window open. Where the hell do you think you're going? he shouted. And the driver leaned out of the window and smiled politely. Uh, good morning, Captain. Uh, have you a permit to be here? Uh, yes, do you want to see it? Uh, no, hell, Lothar told him. The permit is cancelled. You are ordered to leave the township immediately, do you hear? 
Yes, Captain, I hear. There might be trouble, Lothar insisted. You are in danger. I order you to leave immediately for your own safety. Right away, Michael Courtney agreed, and Lothar accelerated away swiftly. Michael watched him in the rearview mirror until he was out of sight, and then he lit a cigarette and drove sedately on in the direction from which the police vehicle had come in such desperate haste. The police captain's agitation had confirmed that he was heading in the right direction, and Michael smiled with satisfaction as he heard the distant sounds of many voices. At the end of the avenue he turned towards the sound, and then pulled into the side of the road and switched off the engine. He sat behind the wheel and stared ahead at the huge crowd that poured down the street towards him. He was unafraid, detached, an observer, not a participant, and as the crowd came on he was studying it avidly, anxious not to miss a single detail, already forming the sentences to describe it and scribbling them in his notebook. Young people in the vanguard, many children amongst them, all of them smiling and laughing and singing. They saw Michael in the park, Morris, and they called to him and gave him the thumbs-up signal. The goodwill of these people always amazes me, he wrote, their cheerfulness and the lack of personal antipathy towards us ruling whites. There was a handsome young man in the van of the march. He walked a few paces ahead of the rest. He had a long, confident stride, so the girl beside him had to skip to keep up with him. She held his hand, and her teeth were even and very white in her lovely dark moon face. She smiled at Michael and waved as she passed him. The crowd split and flowed past on each side of the parked Morris. Some of the children paused to press their faces against the windows, peering in at Michael, and when he grinned and pulled a face at them, they shrieked with laughter and scampered on. One or two of the marchers slapped the roof of the Morris with open palms, but it was rather a cheerful greeting than a hostile act, and they scarcely paused but marched on after the young leaders. For many minutes the crowd flowed past, and then only the stragglers, the latecomers, cripples, and the elderly with stiff hampered gait were going by, and Michael started the engine of the Morris, and you turned across the street. In low gear he followed the crowd at a walking pace, driving with one hand while he scribbled notes in the open pad on his lap. Estimate between six and seven thousand at this stage, but others joining all the time. Old man on crutches with his wife supporting him, a toddler dressed only in a short vest showing his little bum, a woman with a portable radio balanced on her head playing rock and roll music as she dances along, many peasant types, probably illegals, still wearing blankets and barefooted. The singing is beautifully harmonised. Also many well-dressed, obviously educated types, some wearing government uniforms, postmen and bus drivers, and workers in overalls of the steel and coal companies. For once a call has gone out that has reached all of them, not just the politicised minority. A sense of excitement and naive expectation that is palpable. Now the song changes, beginning at the head of the march but the others pick it up swiftly. They are all singing, doleful and tragic, not necessary to understand words. This is a lament. At the head of the march, Amelia sung with such fervour that the tears burst spontaneously from her huge dark eyes and glistened down her cheeks. The road is long, our burden is heavy. How long must we go on? The mood of gaiety changed and the music of many thousand voices soared in a great anguished cry. How long must we suffer? How long? How long? Amelia held hard to Raleigh's hand, and sang with all her being and her very soul, and they turned the last corner. Ahead of them, at the end of the long avenue, was the diamond-meshed fence that surrounded the police station. Then, in the hard china blue of the high-felt sky, Above the corrugated iron roof of the police station, a cluster of tiny dark specks appeared. At first they seemed to be a flock of birds, but they swelled in size with miraculous speed as they approached, shining in the early rays of the morning sun with a silent menace. The head of the march stopped, and those behind pressed up behind and then halted also. All their faces turned up towards the menacing machines that bore down upon them, with gaping shark mouths and outstretched pinions, 
so swiftly that they outran their own engine noise. The leading sabre jet dropped lower still, skimming the roof of the police station, and the rest of the formation followed it down. The singing faltered into silence, and was followed by the first wails of terror and uncertainty. One after another, the great airborne machines hurtled over their heads. It seemed they were low enough to reach up and touch, and the ear-splitting whine of their engines was a physical assault that drove the people to their knees. Some of them crouched in the dusty roadway, others threw themselves flat and covered their heads, while still others turned and tried to run back, but they were blocked by the ranks behind them, and the march disintegrated into a confused, struggling mass. The men were shouting, and the women wailed, and some of the children were shrieking and weeping with terror. The silver jets climbed out and banked steeply, coming around in formation for the next pass. Their engines screamed, and the shock waves of their passing rumbled across the sky. Rally and Amelia were amongst the few who had stood their ground, and now Rally shouted, Do not be afraid, my friends! They cannot harm you! Amelia took her lead from him, and she called to her children, They will not hurt you, my little ones. They are pretty as birds. Just look how they shine in the sun. And the children stifled their terror, and a few of them giggled uncertainly. Here they come again, Raleigh shouted. Wave to them like this. And he cavorted and laughed, and the other young people quickly imitated him, and the people began to laugh with them. This time, as the machines thundered over their heads, only a few of the old women fell over and groveled in the road, but most of them merely cringed and flinched, and then laughed uproariously with relief when the machines were passed. Under the urging of Rally and his marshals, the march began slowly to disentangle itself and move forward again. And when the jet fighters made their third pass, they looked up and waved at the helmeted heads under the transparent canopies. This time the aircraft did not bank and come round. Instead, they winged away into the blue, and the terrible sound of their engines dwindled, and the people began to sing again, and to embrace each other as they marched, celebrating their courage and their victory. "'Today you will be free!' Rally shouted, and those close enough to hear him believed him, and turned to shout to those further back, "'Today we will all be free!' Ahead of them, the gates of the police station yard were closed and locked. But they saw the ranks of men drawn up beyond the wire. The uniforms were dark khaki, and the morning sun sparkled on the badges and on the ugly, stubby blue weapons that the white police carried. Lothar de la Rey stood on the front steps leading up to the charge office. Under the lamp were the words, Police! Polisi, engraved upon the blue glass, and steeled himself not to duck as the formation of jet fighters flashed low over the station roof. He watched the distant mob pulse and contract like some giant black amoeba as the aircraft harassed them, and then regain its shape and come on steadily. He heard the singing swell up in chorus, and he could make out the features of those in the front ranks. The sergeant beside him swore softly, my God, just look at those black bastards. There must be thousands of them. And Lothar recognised in the man's tone his own horror and trepidation. What they were looking upon was the nightmare of the Africana people that had recurred for almost two centuries, ever since their ancestors, moving up slowly from the south through a lovely land populated only by wild game, had met suddenly upon the banks of the great fish river the cohorts of this dark multitude. He felt his nerves crawl like poisonous insects upon his skin as the tribal memories of his people assaulted him. Here they were once more, the tiny handful of white men at the barricades, and there before them was the black barbaric host. It was as it had always been, but the horror of his situation was not in the least diluted by the knowledge that it had all happened before. Rather, it was made more poignant and the natural reaction of defence more compelling. However, the fear and loathing in the sergeant's voice braced Lothar against his own weakness, and he tore his gaze from the approaching horde and looked to his own men. He saw how pale they were, how deathly still they stood, and how very young so many of them were. 
but then it was the Afrikaner tradition that the boys had always taken their places at the lager barricades, even before they were as tall as the long muzzle-loading weapons they carried. Lothar forced himself to move, to walk slowly down the line in front of his men, making certain that no trace of his own fear was evident in expression or gesture. They don't mean trouble, he said. They have their women and children with them. The Bantu always hide the women if they mean to fight. His voice was level and without emotion. The reinforcements are on their way, he told them. We will have 300 men within the hour. Just stay calm and obey orders. He smiled encouragement at a cadet whose eyes were too big for his pale face, whose ears stuck out from under his cap, and who chewed his lower lip nervously as he stared out through the wire. You haven't been given orders to load, Yong. Get that magazine off your weapon, he ordered quietly, and the boy unclipped the long, straight magazine from the side of his sten gun without once taking his eyes from the singing, dancing horde in front of them. Lothar walked back down the line with a deliberate tread, not once glancing at the oncoming mob, nodding encouragement at each of his men as he came level, or distracting them with a quiet word. But once he reached his post on the station steps again, he could no longer contain himself, and he turned to face the gate, and only with difficulty prevented himself exclaiming out loud. They filled the entire roadway from side to side and end to end, and still they came on, more and more of them pouring out of the side road like a Karoo River in flash flood. Stay at your posts, men, he called. Do nothing without orders. And they stood stolidly in the bright morning sunlight while the leaders of the march reached the locked gates and pressed against them, gripping the wire and peering through the mesh, chanting and grinning as behind them the rest of the huge, unwieldy column spread out along the perimeter. Like water contained by a dam wall, compressed by their own multitudes, they were building up rank upon rank until they completely surrounded the station yard, hemming in the small party of uniformed men. And still they came on, those at the back joining the dense throng at the main gates until the station was a tiny rectangular island in a noisy, restless black sea. Then the men at the gates called for silence, and gradually the chanting and laughter and general uproar died away. "'We want to speak with your officers,' called a young black man in the front rank at the closed gates. He had his fingers hooked through the mesh, and the crowd behind him pushed him so hard against the wire that the high gates shook and trembled. The station commander came out of the charge office, and as he went down the steps, Lothar fell in a pace behind him. Together they crossed the yard and halted in front of the gate. This is an illegal gathering, the commander addressed the young man who had called out to them. You must disperse immediately. He was speaking in Afrikaans. It is much worse than that, officer, the young man smiled at him happily. He was replying in English, a calculated provocation. You see, none of us are carrying our passbooks. We have banned them. What is your name, you? The commander demanded in Afrikaans. My name is Rally Tabaka, and I am the branch secretary of the Pan-Africanist Congress, and I demand that you arrest me and all these others, Rally told him in fluent English. Open the gates, policeman, and take us to your prison cells. I'm going to give you five minutes to disperse, the commander told him menacingly. Or what? Rally Tobacco asked. What will you do if we do not obey you? And behind him the crowd began to chant, Arrest us! Arrest us! We have burned the Dom Pass! Arrest us! There was an interruption and a burst of ironic cheers and hooted laughter from the rear of the crowd, and Lothar jumped up on the bonnet of the nearest police Land Rover to see over their heads. A small convoy of three troop carriers filled with uniformed constables had driven out of the side road and was now slowly forcing its way through the crowd. The densely packed ranks gave way only reluctantly before the tall, covered trucks, but Lothar felt a rush of relief. He jumped down from the Land Rover and ordered a squad of his men to open the gates. As the convoy came on, the people beat upon the steel sides of the trucks with their bare fists and jeered and hooted and gave the ANC salute. A fine mist of dust rose around the trucks and the thousands of milling, shuffling feet of the crowd. Lothar's men forced the gates open against the pressure of black bodies, 
and as the trucks drove through, they swung them shut and hurriedly locked them again as the crowd surged forward against them. Lothar left the commander to haggle and bluster with the leaders of the crowd, and he went to deploy the reinforcements along the perimeter of the yard. The new men were all armed, and Lothar posted the older, more steady-looking of them on top of trucks from where they had a sweeping field of fire over all four sides of the fence. Stay calm, he kept repeating. Everything is under control. Just obey your orders. He hurried back to the gateway as soon as he had placed the reinforcements, and the commander was still arguing with the black leaders through the wire. We will not leave here until either you arrest us or the pass laws are abolished. Don't be stupid, man, the commander snapped. You know neither of those things is possible. Then we will stay, Rally Tobacco told him, and the crowd behind him chanted, Arrest us! Arrest us now! I've placed the new men in position, Lothar reported in a low voice. We have nearly two hundred now. God grant it'll be enough if they turn nasty, the commander muttered, and glanced uneasily along the line of uniformed men. It seemed puny and insignificant against the mass that confronted them through the wire. I've argued with you long enough. He turned back to the men behind the gate. You must take these people away now. That is a police order. We stay, Rally Tobacco told him pleasantly. As the morning wore on, so the heat increased, and Lothar could feel the tension and the fear in his men rising with the heat and the thirst and the dust and the chanting. Every few minutes a disturbance in the crowd made it eddy and push like a whirlpool in the flow of a river and each time the fence shook and swayed, and the white men fingered their guns, and fidgeted in the baking sun. Twice more during the morning, reinforcements arrived, and the crowd let them through until there were almost three hundred armed police in the compound. But instead of dispersing, the crowd continued to grow, as every last person who had hidden away in the township cottages, expecting trouble, finally succumbed to curiosity, and crept out to join the multitude. After each new arrival of trucks, there was another round of argument and futile orders to disperse, and in the heat and the impatience of waiting, the mood of the crowd gradually changed. There were no more smiles, and the singing had a different tone to it, as they begun to hung the fierce fighting songs. Rumours flashed through the throng. Robert Sabukwe was coming to speak to them. Favut had ordered the passes to be abolished, and Moses Garma to be released from jail, and they cheered and sang, and then growled and surged back and forth as each rumour was denied. The sun made its noon, blazing down upon them, and the smell of the crowd was the musky African odour, alien and yet dreadfully familiar. 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 The white men who had stood to arms all that morning were reaching the point of nervous exhaustion, and each time the crowd surged against the frail wire fence, they made little jumpy movements, and one or two of them, without orders, loaded their sten guns and lifted them into the high port position. Lothar noticed this and went down the line, ordering them to unload and uncock their weapons. We have to do something soon, sir, he told his commander. We can't go on like this. Someone or something is going to snap. It was in the air, strong as the odour of hot African bodies, and Lothar felt it in himself. He had not slept that night, and he was haggard, and he felt brittle and jagged as a blade of obsidian. "'What do you suggest, Delaray?' the commander barked irritably, just as edgy and tense. "'We must do something, you say. Yeah, I agree, but what?' "'We should take the ringleaders out of the mob,' Lothar pointed at Rally Tobacco, who was still at the gate. It was almost five hours since he had taken up his position there. "'That black swine there is holding them together.' If we pick him and the other ringleaders out, the rest of them will soon lose interest. What is the time? the commander asked, and although it seemed irrelevant, Lothar glanced at his watch. It's almost one o'clock. There must be more reinforcements on the way, the commander said. We'll wait another fifteen minutes, and then we will do as you suggest. Look there, Lothar snapped and pointed to the left. Some of the younger men in the crowd had armed themselves with stones and bricks and from the rear other missiles, chunks of paving slab and rocks, were being passed over the heads of the crowd to those in the front ranks. Yeah, we have to break this up now, the commander agreed, or else there'll be serious trouble. 
Lothar turned and called a curt order to the constables nearest him. You men, load your weapons and move up to the gate with me. He saw that some of the men further down the line had taken his words as a general order to load, and there was the snicker of metal on metal as the magazines were clamped onto the Sten guns and the cocking handles jerked back. Lothar debated with himself for a moment whether he should countermand, but time was vital. He knew he had to get the leaders out of the crowd, for violence was only seconds away. Some of the black youths in front of the crowd were already shaking the mesh and heaving against it. With his men behind him, he marched to the gate and pointed at Rally to back her. You, he shouted, I want to speak to you. He reached through the square opening beside the gate lock and seized the front of Raleigh's shirt. I want you out of there, he snarled, and Raleigh pulled back against his grip, jostling the men behind him. Amelia screamed and clawed at Lothar's wrist. Leave him! You must not hurt him! The young men around them saw what was happening and hurled themselves against the fence. Gee! they cried, that long, deep, drawn-out war cry that no Nguni warrior can resist. It made their blood smoke with the fighting madness, and it was taken up as others echoed them. Gee! The section of the crowd behind where Raleigh struggled with Lothar de la Rey heaved forward, throwing themselves upon the fence, humming the war cry, and the fence buckled and began to topple. Get back! Lothar shouted at his men, but the back ranks of the crowd surged forward to see what was happening in front, and the fence went. It came crashing over, and though Lothar jumped back, one of the metal posts hit him a glancing blow, and he was knocked to his knees. The crowd was no longer contained, and the ranks behind pushed those in front, so they came bursting into the yard, trampling over Lothar as he struggled to get to his feet. From one side, a brick came sailing out of the crowd in a high parabola. It struck the windscreen of one of the parked trucks and shattered it in a shower of diamond-bright chips. The women were screaming and falling under the feet of those who were borne forward by the pressure from behind, and men were fighting to get back behind the wire as others thrust them forward, uttering that murderous war cry, Gee! that brought on the madness. Lothar was sprawled under the rushing tide, struggling to regain his feet, while a hail of stones and bricks came over the wire. Lothar rolled to his feet, and only because he was a superb athlete, he kept his balance as the rush of frenzied bodies carried him backwards. There was a loud and jarring noise close behind him that Lothar did not at first recognise. It sounded as though a steel rod had been drawn rapidly across a sheet of corrugated iron. Then he heard the other terrible sounds, the multiple impact of bullets into living flesh, like ripe melons bursting open from blows with a heavy club. And he shouted, No! Oh, good Christ, no! But the Sten guns rushed and tore the air with a sound like sheets of silk being ripped through, drowning out his despairing protest. And he wanted to shout again, Cease fire! But his throat had closed, and he was suffocating with horror and terror. He made another strenuous effort to give the order, and his throat strained to enunciate the words. But no sound came, and his hands moved without his conscious volition, lifting the Sten gun from his side, jerking back the cocking handle to feed around into the breach. In front of him the crowd was breaking and turning. The pressure of human bodies against him was relieved, so he could mount the machine pistol to waist height. He tried to stop himself, but it was all a nightmare over which he had no control. The weapon in his hands shuddered and buzzed like a chainsaw. In a few fleeting seconds, the magazine of thirty rounds was empty. But Lothar had traversed the Sten gun like a reaper swinging a scythe, and now the bloody harvest lay before him in the dust, twitching and kicking and moaning. Only then did he realise fully what he had done, and his voice returned. Cease fire! he screamed, and struck out at the men around him to reinforce the order. Cease fire! Stop it! Stop it! Some of the younger recruits were reloading to fire again, and he ran amongst them, striking out with the empty sten to prevent them. A man on the roof of one of the troop carriers lifted his weapon and fired another burst, and Lothar leapt onto the cab and knocked up the barrel so that the last spray of bullets went high into the dusty air. From his vantage point on the cab of the truck, 
Lothar looked out over the sagging fence across the open ground where the dead and the wounded lay, and his spirit quailed. Oh, God forgive me. What have we done? he choked. Oh, what have we done? In the middle of the morning, Michael Courtney took a chance, for there seemed to be a lull in the activity around the police station. It was, of course, difficult to make out exactly what was happening. He could see only the backs of the rear ranks of the crowd, and over their heads the top of the wire fence and the iron roof of the station. However, the situation seemed for the moment to be quiet, and apart from a little desultory singing, the crowd was passive and patient. He jumped into the Morris and drove back down the avenue to the primary school. The buildings were deserted, and without any qualms he tried the door which was marked Headmaster, and it was unlocked. There was a telephone on the cheap deal desk. He got through to the mail offices on the first try, and Leon Herbstein was in his office. I've got a story, Michael said, and read out his copy. When he finished, he told Leon, If I were you, I'd send a staff photographer down here. There is a good chance of some dramatic pictures. Give me the directions how to find you, Leon acquiesced immediately, and Michael drove back to the police station, just as another convoy of police reinforcements pushed through the crowd and entered the station gates. The morning wore on, and Michael ran out of cigarettes, a minor tragedy. He was also hot and thirsty, and wondered what it was like standing in that mob out there, hour after hour. He could sense the mood of the crowd changing. They were no longer cheerful and expectant. There was a sense of frustration, of having been cheated and duped, for Sabuqui had not arrived, nor had the white police made the promised announcement to abolish the Dompas. The singing started again, but in a harsh and aggressive tone. There were scuffles and disturbances in the crowd, and over their heads Michael saw the armed police take up positions on the cabs of the trucks parked beyond the wire. The staff photographer from the mail arrived, a young black journalist who was able to enter the township without a permit. He parked his small brown Humber beside the Morris, and Michael catched a cigarette from him and then quickly briefed him on what was happening and sent him forward to mingle with the back roads of the crowd and get to work. A little after noon, some of the youths broke away from the crowd and began to search the verges of the road and the nearest gardens for missiles. They pulled up the bricks that bordered the flower beds and broke chunks off the concrete paving slabs, then hurried back to join the crowd, carrying those crude weapons. This was an ominous development, and Michael climbed up on the bonnet of his beloved Morris, careless of the paintwork which he usually cherished and polished every morning. Although he was over 150 yards from the station gate, he now had a better view over the heads of the crowd, and he watched the growing agitation and restlessness until the police on the vehicle cabs, the only ones he could see, raised and began loading and cocking their weapons. They were obviously responding to an order, and Michael felt a peculiar little chill of anxiety. Suddenly there was a violent disturbance in the densest part of the crowd directly in front of the main gates. The mass of people surged and heaved, and there was an uproar of protesting shouts and cries. Those in the rear of the crowd, closest to where Michael stood, pushed forward to see what was going on, and suddenly there was a metallic rending sound. Michael saw the tops of the gates begin to move, toppling and bending under the strain, and as they went over there was a scattered volley of thrown rocks and bricks, and then, like the waters of a broken dam, the crowd rushed forward. Michael had never heard the sound of a submachine gun before, so he did not recognise it, but he had heard a bullet striking flesh during that childhood safari on which his father had taken the brothers. The sound was unmistakable, a meaty thumping, almost like a housewife beating a dusty carpet. However, he couldn't believe it, not until he saw the policemen on the cabs of the vehicles. Even in his horror, he noticed how the weapons they held jumped and spurted tiny petals of fire an instant before the sound reached him. The crowd broke and ran at the first buzzing bursts of fire. They spread out like ripples across a pond, streaming back past where Michael stood, and incredibly, some of them were laughing, as though they had not realised what was happening, as though it were all some silly game. In front of the broken gates, the bodies were strewn, most thickly, nearly all of them face down and with their heads pointing outwards, in the direction they were running 
as they were struck down. But there were others further out, and the guns were still clamouring, and people were still falling right beside where Michael stood, and the area around the police station was clear, so that through the dust he could see the figures of the uniformed police beyond the sagging wire. Some of them were reloading, and others were still firing. Michael heard the flitting sound of bullets passing close beside his head, but he was too mesmerised and shocked to duck or even to flinch. Twenty paces away a young couple ran back past him. He recognised them as the pair who had headed the procession earlier, the tall, good-looking lad and the pretty, moon-faced girl. They were still holding hands, the boy dragging the girl along with him, but as they passed Michael, the girl broke free and doubled back to where a child was standing bewildered and lost amongst the carnage. As the girl stooped to pick up the child, the bullets hit her. She was thrown back abruptly, as though she had reached the end of an invisible leash. But she stayed on her feet for a few seconds longer, and Michael saw the bullets come out through her back at the level of her lowest ribs. For a brief moment they raised little tented peaks in the cloth of her blouse, and then erupted in pink smoky puffs of blood and tissue. The girl pirouetted and began to sag. As she turned, Michael saw the two entry wounds in her chest, dark studs on the white cloth, and she collapsed onto her knees. Her companion ran back to try and support her, but she slipped through his hands and fell forward on her face. The boy dropped down beside her and lifted her in his arms, and Michael saw his expression. He had never before seen such desolation and human suffering in another being. Raleigh held Amelia in his arms, her head drooped against his shoulder like that of a sleepy child, and he could feel her blood soaking into his clothing. It was hot as spilled coffee, and it smelled sickly sweet in the heat. Raleigh groped in his pocket and found his handkerchief. Gently he wiped the dust from her cheeks and from the corners of her mouth for she had fallen with her face against the earth. He was crooning to her softly. Wake up, my little moon. Let me hear your sweet voice. Her eyes were open, and he turned her head slightly to look into them. It is me, Amelia, it is Raleigh. Don't you see me? But even as he stared into her widely distended pupils, a milky sheen spread over them, dulling out their dark beauty. He hugged her harder, pressing her unresisting head against his chest, and he began to rock her, humming softly to her as though she were an infant, and he looked out across the field. The bodies were strewn about like overripe fruit fallen from the bough. Some of them were moving, an arm straightened or a hand unclenched. An old man began to crawl past where Raleigh knelt, dragging a shattered leg behind him. Then the police officers were coming out through the sagging gates. They wandered about the field in a dazed, uncertain manner, still carrying their empty weapons dangling from limp hands, stopping to kneel briefly beside one of the bodies, and then standing again and walking on. One of them approached. As he came closer, Raleigh recognised the blonde captain who had seized him at the gate. He had lost his cap, and the top button was missing from his tunic. His crew-cut hair was darkened with sweat, and droplets of sweat stood on his waxen pale forehead. He stopped a few paces off and looked at Raleigh. Although his hair was blonde, his eyebrows were dark and thick, and his eyes were yellow as those of a leopard. Raleigh knew then how he had earned his nickname. Those pale eyes were underscored with smudges of fatigue and horror, dark as old bruises, and his lips were dry and cracked. They stared at each other, the black man kneeling in the dust with the dead woman in his arms, and the uniformed white man with the empty sten gun in his hands. I didn't mean it to happen, said Lothar de la Rey, and his voice croaked. I'm sorry. Raleigh did not answer, gave no sign of having heard or understood, and Lothar turned away, and walked back, picking his way amongst the dead and the maimed, back into the lager of wire mesh. The blood on Raleigh's clothing began to cool, and when he touched Amelia's cheek again, he felt the warmth going out of it also. Gently he closed her eyelids, 
and then he unbuttoned the front of her blouse. There was very little bleeding from the two entry wounds. They were just below her pointed virgin breasts, small dark mouths in her smooth amber-coloured skin, set only inches apart. Rally ran two fingers of his right hand into those bloody mouths, and there was residual warmth in her torn flesh. With my fingers in your dead body, he whispered, with the fingers of my right hand in your wounds, I swear an oath, my love. You will be avenged. I swear it on our love, upon my life, and upon your death. You will be avenged. 